was run away from once or twice through forgetting to block the sleigh when he stopped, and he broke many lashings and ruined a few thongs before he could be trusted with a full team of eight and a light sleigh. Then he felt himself a person of consequence, and on smooth, black ice, with a bold heart and a quick elbow, he smoked along over the levels as fast as a pack in full cry. He would go ten miles to the seal holes, and when he was on the hunting grounds, he would twitch a trace loose from the pitu and free the big black leader, who was the cleverest dog in the team. As soon as the dog had scented a breathing hole, Kutuko would reverse the sleigh, driving a couple of sawed-off antlers that stuck up like perambulator handles from the backrest deep into the snow, so that the team could not get away. Then he would crawl forward inch by inch and wait till the seal came up to breathe. Then he would stab down swiftly with his spear and running line and presently would haul his seal up to the lip of the ice while the black leader came up and helped to pull the carcass across the ice to the sleigh. That was the time when the harnessed dogs yelled and foamed with excitement and Katuka laid the long lash like a red-hot bar across all their faces till the carcass froze stiff. Going home was the heavy work. The loaded sleigh had to be humoured among the rough ice, and the dogs sat down and looked hungrily at the seal instead of pulling. At last they would strike the well-worn sleigh road to the village, and Toodlekey along the ringing ice, heads down and tails up, while Katuko struck up the Angutivon Taina Taunane Taina, the song of the returning hunter, and voices hailed him from house to house under all that dim, starlit sky. When Kotuko the dog came to his full growth, he enjoyed himself too. He fought his way up the team steadily, fight after fight, till one fine evening, over their food, he tackled the big black leader. Kotuko the boy saw fair play, and made second dog of him, as they say. So he was promoted to the long song of the leading dog, running five feet in advance of all the others. It was his bounden duty to stop all fighting, in harness or out of it, and he wore a collar of copper wire, very thick and heavy. On special occasions he was fed with cooked food inside the house, and sometimes was allowed to sleep on the bench with Katuko. He was a good seal dog, and would keep a musk ox at bay by running round him and snapping at his heels. He would even, and this for a sleigh dog is the last proof of bravery, he would even stand up to the gaunt arctic wolf whom all dogs of the north, as a rule, fear beyond anything that walks the snow. He and his master, they did not count the team of ordinary dogs as company, hunted together day after day and night after night, fur-wrapped boy and savage, long-haired, narrow-eyed, white-fanged, yellow brute. All an Inuit has to do is to get food and skins for himself and his family. The women folk make the skins into clothing, and occasionally help in trapping small game. But the bulk of the food, and they eat enormously, must be found by the men. If the supply fails, there is no one up there to buy or beg or borrow from. The people must die. An Inuit does not think of these chances till he is forced to. Kadlu, Kotuko, Amarak, and the boy baby who kicked about in Amarak's fur hood and chewed pieces of blubber all day were as happy together as any family in the world. They came of a very gentle race, and Inuit seldom loses his temper and almost never strikes a child, who did not know exactly what telling a real lie meant, still less how to steal. They were content to spear their living out of the heart of the bitter, hopeless cold, to smile oily smiles and tell queer ghost and fairy tales of evenings, and eat till they could eat no more, and sing the endless woman's song Amna aya aya amna ah ah, through the long lamp lighted days as they mended their clothes and their hunting gear. But one terrible winter, everything betrayed them. The Tunanirmiut returned from the yearly salmon fishing and made their houses on the early ice to the north of Bylot's Island, ready to go after the seal as soon as the sea froze. But it was an early and savage autumn. All through September there were continuous gales that broke up the smooth seal ice when it was only four or five feet thick and forced it inland, and piled a great barrier some twenty miles broad of lumped and ragged and needly ice over which it was impossible to draw the dog sleighs. The edge of the floe off which the seal were used to fish in winter lay perhaps twenty miles beyond this barrier and out of reach of the Tunonirmiut. Even so, 
they might have managed to scrape through the winter on their stock of frozen salmon and stored blubber and what the traps gave them. But in December, one of their hunters came across a tupic, a skin tent, of three women and a girl nearly dead, whose men had come down from the far north and been crushed in their little skin hunting boats while they were out after the longhorn narwhal. Tadlu, of course, could only distribute the women among the huts of the winter village, for no Inuit dare refuse a meal to a stranger. He never knows when his own turn may come to beg. Amarak took the girl, who was about fourteen, into her own house as a sort of servant. From the cut of her sharp pointed hood and the long diamond pattern of her white deerskin leggings, they supposed she came from Ellesmere land. She had never seen tin cooking pots or wooden shod sleighs before, but Katuka the boy and Katuka the dog were rather fond of her. Then all the foxes went south, and even the wolverine, that growling, blunt-headed little thief of the snow, did not take the trouble to follow the line of empty traps that Kotuko set. The tribe lost a couple of their best hunters, who were badly crippled in a fight with a muskox, and this threw more work on the others. Kotuko went out day after day with a light hunting sleigh and six or seven of the strongest dogs, looking till his eyes ached for some patch of clear ice where a seal might perhaps have scratched a breathing hole. Kotuko the dog ranged far and wide, and in the dead stillness of the ice fields, Kotuko the boy could hear his half-choked whine of excitement above a seal hole three miles away, as plainly as though he were at his elbow. When the dog found a hole, the boy would build himself a little low snow wall to keep off the worst of the bitter wind, and there he would wait ten, twelve, twenty hours for the seal to come up to breathe, his eyes glued to the tiny mark he had made above the hole to guide the downward thrust of his harpoon a little sealskin mat under his feet, and his legs tied together in the tutarang, the buckle that the old hunters had talked about. This helped to keep a man's legs from twitching as he waits and waits and waits for the quick-eared seal to rise. Though there is no excitement in it, you can easily believe that the sitting still in the buckle, with the thermometer perhaps forty degrees below zero, is the hardest work an Inuit knows. When a seal was caught, Kotuko the dog would bound forward, his trace trailing behind him, and help to pull the body to the sleigh, where the tired and hungry dogs lay sullenly under the lee of the broken ice. A seal did not go very far, for each mouth in the little village had a right to be filled, and neither bone, hide, nor sinew was wasted. The dog's meat was taken for human use, and Amarak fed the team with pieces of old summer skin tents raked out from under the sleeping bench and they howled and howled again, and waked to howl hungrily. One could tell by the soapstone lamps in the huts that famine was near. In good seasons, when blubber was plentiful, the light in the boat-shaped lamps would be two feet high, cheerful, oily, and yellow. Now it was a bare six inches. Amarak carefully pricked down the moss wick when an unwatched flame brightened for a moment, and the eyes of all the family followed her hand. The horror of famine up there in the great cold is not so much dying as dying in the dark. All the Inuit dread the dark that presses on them without a break for six months in each year. And when the lamps are low in the houses, the minds of people begin to be shaken and confused. But worse was to come. The underfed dogs snapped and growled in the passages, glaring at the cold stars and snuffing into the bitter wind night after night. When they stopped howling, the silence fell down again as solid and as heavy as a snowdrift against a door, and men could hear the beating of their blood in the thin passages of the ear, and the thumping of their own hearts that sounded as loud as the noise of sorcerer's drums beaten across the snow. One night, Katuko the dog, who had been unusually sullen in harness, leaped up and pushed his head against Katuko's knee. Katuko patted him, but the dog still pushed blindly forward, fawning. Then Kadlu waked and gripped the heavy wolf-like head and stared into the glassy eyes. The dog whimpered and shivered between Kadlu's knees. The hair rose about his neck, and he growled, as though a stranger were at the door. Then he barked joyously and rolled on the ground and bit at Katuko's boot like a puppy. "'What is it?' said Katuko, for he was beginning to be afraid. "'The sickness!' 
Cadlo answered. It is the dog sickness. Matuko the dog lifted his nose and howled and howled again. I have not seen this before. What will he do? said Katuko. Kadlu shrugged one shoulder a little and crossed the hut for his short stabbing harpoon. The big dog looked at him, howled again, and slunk away down the passage, while the other dogs drew aside right and left to give him ample room. When he was out on the snow, he barked furiously, as though on the trail of a musk ox, and, barking and leaping and frisking, passed out of sight. This was not hydrophobia, but simple, plain madness. The cold and the hunger, and above all the dark, had turned his head. And when the terrible dog sickness once shows itself in a team, it spreads like wildfire. Next hunting day, another dog sickened, and was killed then and there by Kotuko as he bit and struggled among the traces. Then the black second dog, who had been the leader in the old days, suddenly gave tongue on an imaginary reindeer track, and when they slipped him from the pitu, he flew at the throat of an ice cliff and ran away, as his leader had done, his harness on his back. After that, no one would take the dogs out again. They needed them for something else, and the dogs knew it. And though they were tied down and fed by hand, their eyes were full of despair and fear. To make things worse, the old women began to tell ghost tales, and to say that they had met the spirits of dead hunters lost that autumn, who prophesied all sorts of horrible things. Katuko grieved more for the loss of his dog than anything else. For, though an Inuit eats enormously, he also knows how to starve. But the hunger, the darkness, the cold, and the exposure told on his strength. And he began to hear voices inside his head, and to see people who were not there out of the tail of his eye. One night he had unbuckled himself after ten hours waiting above a blind seal hole, and was staggering back to the village faint and dizzy. He halted to lean his back against a boulder which happened to be supported like a rocking stone on a single jutting point of ice. His weight disturbed the balance of the thing. It rolled over ponderously, and as Katuko sprang aside to avoid it, slid after him, squeaking and hissing on the ice slope. That was enough for Katuko. He had been brought up to believe that every rock and boulder had its owner, its Inua, who was generally a one-eyed kind of a woman thing called a tornak, and that when a tornak meant to help a man, she rolled after him inside her stone house and asked him whether he would take her for a guardian spirit. In summer thaws, the ice-propped rocks and boulders roll and slip all over the face of the land, so you can easily see how the idea of live stones arose. Katuko heard the blood beating in his ears as he had heard it all day, and he thought that was the tornak of the stone speaking to him. Before he reached home, he was quite certain that he had held a long conversation with her, and, as all his people believed that this was quite possible, no one contradicted him. She said to me, I jumped down, I jumped down from my place on the snow, cried Kotuko, with hollow eyes, leaning forward in the half-lighted hut. She said, I will be a guide. He says, I will guide you to the good seal holes. Tomorrow I go out, and the Tornak will guide me. Then the Angercock, the village sorcerer, came in, and Kotuko told him the tale a second time. It lost nothing in the telling. Follow the Tornite, the spirits of the stones, and they will bring us food again, said the Angercock. Now the girl from the north had been lying near the lamp, eating very little and saying less for days past. But when Amarak and Kadlu next morning packed and lashed a little hand sleigh for Kotuko and loaded it with his hunting gear and as much blubber and frozen seal meat as they could spare, she took the pulling rope and stepped out boldly at the boy's side. Your house is my house, she said, as the little bone-shod sleigh squeaked and bumped behind them in the awful Arctic night. My house is your house, said Kotuko, but I think that we shall both go to Sedna together. Now Sedna is the mistress of the underworld, and the Inuit believe that everyone who dies must spend a year in her horrible country before going to Quadliparmu, the happy place, where it never freezes and the fat reindeer trot up when you call. Through the village the people were shouting, The Tornite have spoken to Kotuko. They will show him open ice. He will bring us the seal again. Their voices were soon swallowed up by the cold, empty dark, 
and Kotoko and the girl shouldered close together as they strained on the pulling rope or humoured the sleigh through the broken ice in the direction of the polar sea. Kotoko insisted that the Tornak of the Stone had told him to go north, and north they went under Tuk Tukjung the reindeer, those stars that we call the Great Bear. No European could have made five miles a day over the ice rubbish and the sharp-edged drifts, but those two knew exactly the turn of the wrist that coaxes a sleigh round a hummock, the jerk that neatly lifts it out of an ice crack, and the exact strength that goes to the few quiet strokes of the spearhead that make a path possible when everything looks hopeless. The girl said nothing, but bowed her head, and the long wolverine fur fringe of her ermine hood blew across her broad, dark face. The sky above them was an intense velvety black, changing to bands of Indian red on the horizon, where the great stars burned like street lamps. From time to time, a greenish wave of the northern lights would roll across the hollow of the high heavens, flick like a flag and disappear, or a meteor would crackle from darkness to darkness, trailing a shower of sparks behind. Then they could see the ridged and furrowed surface of the flow tipped and laced with strange colours, red, copper and bluish. But in the ordinary starlight, everything turned to one frost-bitten grey. The flow, as you will remember, had been battered and tormented by the autumn gales till it was one frozen earthquake. There were gullies and ravines and holes like gravel pits cut in ice, lumps and scattered pieces frozen down to the original floor of the flow, blotches of old black ice that had been thrust under the flow in some gale and heaved up again, roundish boulders of ice, saw like edges of ice carved by the snow that flies before the wind and sunken pits where thirty or forty acres lay below the level of the rest of the field. From a little distance you might have taken the lumps for seal or walrus, overturned sleighs or men on a hunting expedition, or even the great ten-legged white spirit bear himself. But in spite of these fantastic shapes, all on the very edge of starting into life, there was neither sound nor the least faint echo of sound. And through this silence and through this waste, where the sudden lights flapped and went out again, the sleigh and the two that pulled it crawled like things in a nightmare. A nightmare of the end of the world at the end of the world. When they were tired, there Kotuka would make what the hunters call a half-house, a very small snow hut into which they would huddle with the travelling lamp and try to thaw out the frozen seal meat. When they had slept, the march began again. Thirty miles a day to get ten miles northward. The girl was always very silent, but Kotuko muttered to himself and broke out into songs he had learned in the singing house, summer songs and reindeer and salmon songs, all horribly out of place at that season. He would declare that he heard the Tornak growling to him and would run wildly up a hummock, tossing his arms and speaking in loud, threatening tones. To tell the truth, Kotuko was very nearly crazy for the time being but the girl was sure that he was being guided by his guardian spirit and that everything would come right. She was not surprised, therefore, when at the end of the fourth march, Katuko, whose eyes were burning like fireballs in his head, told her that his tornak was following them across the snow in the shape of a two-headed dog. The girl looked where Katuko pointed, and something seemed to slip into a ravine. It was certainly not human, but everybody knew that the Tornite preferred to appear in the shape of bear and seal and such like. It might have been the ten-legged white spirit bear himself, or it might have been anything, for Katuko and the girl were so starved that their eyes were untrustworthy. They had trapped nothing and seen no trace of game since they had left the village. Their food would not hold out for another week, and there was a gale coming. A polar storm can blow for ten days without a break, and all that while it is certain death to be abroad. Kotuko laid up a snow house large enough to take in the hand sleigh, never be separated from your meat, and while he was shaping the last irregular block of ice that makes the keystone of the roof, he saw a thing looking at him from a little cliff of ice half a mile away. The air was hazy, and the thing seemed to be forty feet long and ten feet high, with twenty feet of tail and a shape that quivered all along the outlines. The girl saw it too, but instead of crying aloud with terror, said quietly, That is Kwaikwan. What comes after? He will speak to me, said Kotuko, 
but the snow knife trembled in his hand as he spoke, because however much a man may believe that he is a friend of strange and ugly spirits, he seldom likes to be taken quite at his word. Kwaikwan, too, is the phantom of a gigantic, toothless dog without any hair, who is supposed to live in the far north and to wander about the country just before things are going to happen. It may be pleasant or unpleasant things, but not even the sorcerers care to speak about Kwaikwan. He makes the dogs go mad. Like the spirit bear, he has several extra pairs of legs, six or eight, and this thing jumping up and down in the haze had more legs than any real dog needed. Kotuko and the girl huddled into their hut quickly. Of course, if Kwaikwan had wanted them, he could have torn it to pieces above their heads. But the sense of a foot-thick snow wall between themselves and the wicked dark was great comfort. The gale broke with a shriek of wind like the shriek of a train, and for three days and three nights it held, never varying one point, and never lulling even for a minute. They fed the stone lamp between their knees, and nibbled at the half-warm seal meat, and watched the black soot gather on the roof for seventy-two long hours. The girl counted up the food in the sleigh. There was not more than two days' supply, and Kotuko looked over the iron heads and the deer sinew fastenings of his harpoon and his seal lance and his bird dart. There was nothing else to do. We shall go to Sedna soon, very soon, the girl whispered. In three days we shall lie down and go. Will your tornak do nothing? Sing her an angercock song to make her come here. He began to sing in the high-pitched howl of the magic songs, and the gale went down slowly. In the middle of his song, the girl started, laid her mittened hand and then her head to the ice floor of the hut. Kotuko followed her example, and the two kneeled, staring into each other's eyes and listening with every nerve. He ripped a thin sliver of whalebone from the rim of a bird snare that lay on the sleigh, and, after straightening, set it upright in a little hole in the ice firming it down with his mitten. It was almost as delicately adjusted as a compass needle, and now, instead of listening, they watched. The thin rod quivered a little, the least little jar in the world. Then it vibrated steadily for a few seconds, came to rest, and vibrated again, this time nodding to another point of the compass. Too soon, said Kotuko. Some big flow has broken far away outside. The girl pointed at the rod and shook her head. It is the big breaking, she said. Listen to the ground ice. It knocks. When they kneeled this time, they heard the most curious grunts and knockings, apparently under their feet. Sometimes it sounded as though a blind puppy were squeaking above the lamp, then as if a stone were being ground on hard ice, and again like muffled blows on a drum. But all dragged out and made small, as though they travelled through a little horn a weary distance away. We shall not go to Sedna lying down, said Kotuko. It is the breaking. The Tornak has cheated us. We shall die. All this may sound absurd enough, but the two were face to face with a very real danger. The three days' gale had driven the deep water of Baffin's Bay southerly and piled it onto the edge of the far reaching land ice that stretches from Bylot's Island to the west. Also, the strong current which sets east out of Lancaster Sound carried with it mile upon mile of what they call pack ice, rough ice that has not frozen into fields. And this pack was bombarding the flow at the same time that the swell and heave of the storm-worked sea was weakening and undermining it. What Katuko and the girl had been listening to were the faint echoes of that fight thirty or forty miles away, and the little tell-tale rod quivered to the shock of it. Now, as the Inuit say, when the ice once wakes after its long winter sleep, there is no knowing what may happen, for solid flow ice changes shape almost as quickly as a cloud. The gale was evidently a spring gale sent out of time, and anything was possible. Yet the two were happier in their minds than before. If the flow broke up, there would be no more waiting and suffering. Spirits, goblins, and witch people were moving about on the racking ice, and they might find themselves stepping into Sedna's country side by side with all sorts of wild things, the flush of excitement still on them. When they left the hut after the gale, the noise on the horizon was steadily growing, and the tough ice moaned and buzzed all round them. It is still waiting, said Kotuko. 
On the top of a hummock sat or crouched the eight-legged thing that they had seen three days before, and it howled terribly. Let us follow, said the girl. It may know some way that does not lead to Sedna. But she reeled from weakness as she took the pulling rope. The thing moved off slowly and clumsily across the ridges, heading always toward the westward and the land, and they followed, while the growling thunder at the edge of the flow rolled nearer and nearer. The flow's lip was split and cracked in every direction for three or four miles inland, and great pans of ten-foot-thick ice from a few yards to twenty acres square were jolting and ducking and surging into one another and into the yet unbroken flow as the heavy swell took and shook and spouted between them. This battering ram ice was, so to speak, the first army that the sea was flinging against the flow. The incessant crash and jar of these cakes almost drowned the ripping sound of sheets of pack ice driven bodily under the flow, as cards are hastily pushed under a tablecloth. Where the water was shallow, these sheets would be piled one atop of the other, till the bottommost touched mud fifty feet down, and the discoloured sea banked behind the muddy ice till the increasing pressure drove all forward again. In addition to the flow and the pack ice, the gale and the currents were bringing down true bergs, sailing mountains of ice, snapped off from the Greenland side of the water or the north shore of Melville Bay. They pounded in solemnly, the waves breaking white round them, and advanced on the flow like an old-time fleet under full sail. A berg that seemed ready to carry the world before it would ground helplessly in deep water, reel over, and wallow in a lather of foam and mud and flying frozen spray, while a much smaller and lower one would rip and ride into the flat flow, flinging tons of ice on either side, and cutting a track half a mile long before it was stopped. Some fell like swords, shearing a raw-edged canal, and others splintered into a shower of blocks, weighing scores of tons apiece, that whirled and skirled among the hummocks. Others, again, rose up bodily out of the water when they shoaled, twisted as though in pain, and fell solidly on their sides, while the sea threshed over their shoulders. This trampling and crowding and bending and buckling and arching of the ice into every possible shape was going on as far as the eye could reach all along the north line of the flow. From where Kotuko and the girl were, the confusion looked no more than an uneasy rippling, crawling movement under the horizon. But it came toward them each moment, and they could hear, far away to landward, a heavy booming, as it might have been the boom of artillery through a fog. That showed that the flow was being jammed home against the iron cliffs of Bylot's Island, the land to the southward behind them. "'This has never been before,' said Kotuko, staring stupidly. "'This is not the time. How can the flow break now?' "'Follow that,' the girl cried pointing to the thing, half limping, half running distractedly before them. They followed, tugging at the hand sleigh, while nearer and nearer came the roaring march of the ice. At last the fields round them cracked and starred in every direction, and the cracks opened and snapped like the teeth of wolves. But where the thing rested on a mound of old and scattered ice blocks some fifty feet high, there was no motion. Kotuko leaped forward wildly, dragging the girl after him, and crawled to the bottom of the mound. The talking of ice grew louder and louder round them, but the mound stayed fast, and, as the girl looked at him, he threw his right elbow upward and outward, making the Inuit sign for land in the shape of an island. And land it was that the eight-legged limping thing had led them to, some granite-tipped sand-beached islet off the coast, shod and sheathed and masked with ice, so that no man could have told it from the flow. But at the bottom solid earth and not shifting ice. The smashing and rebound of the flows as they grounded and splintered marked the borders of it, and a friendly shoal ran out to the northward and turned aside the rush of the heaviest ice exactly as a ploughshare turns over loam. There was danger, of course, that some heavily squeezed ice field might shoot up the beach and plane off the top of the islet bodily, but that did not trouble Katuko and the girl when they made their snow house and began to eat and heard the ice hammer and skid along the beach. The thing had disappeared, and Katuka was talking excitedly about his power over spirits as he crouched round the lamp. In the middle of his wild sayings, the girl began to laugh, and rock herself backward and forward. Behind her shoulder, 
Crawling into the hut, crawl by crawl, there were two heads, one yellow and one black, that belonged to two of the most sorrowful and ashamed dogs that you ever saw. Kotuko the dog was one, and the black leader was the other. Both were now fat, well-looking, and quite restored to their proper minds, but coupled to each other in an extraordinary fashion. When the black leader ran off, you remember, his harness was still on him. He must have met Kotuko the dog and played or fought with him, for his shoulder leap had caught in the plaited copper wire of Kotuko's collar and had drawn tight so that neither could get at the trace to gnaw it apart. But each was fastened sidelong to his neighbor's neck. That, with the freedom of hunting on their own account, must have helped to cure their madness. They were very sober. The girl pushed the two shamefaced creatures toward Kotuko and, sobbing with laughter, cried, that is Kwaikwern, who led us to safe ground. Look at his eight legs and double head. Kotuko cut them free, and they fell into his arms, yellow and black together, trying to explain how they had got their senses back again. Kotuko ran a hand down their ribs, which were round and well clothed. They have found food, he said, with a grin. I do not think we shall go to Sedna so soon. My Tornak sent these. The sickness has left them. As soon as they had greeted Kotuko, these two, who had been forced to sleep and eat and hunt together for the past few weeks, flew at each other's throat, and there was a beautiful battle in the snow-house. Empty dogs do not fight, Kotuko said. They have found the seal. Let us sleep. We shall find food. When they waked, there was open water on the north beach of the island, and all the loosened ice had been driven landward. The first sound of the surf is one of the most delightful that the Inuit can hear, for it means that spring is on the road. Kotuko and the girl took hold of hands and smiled, for the clear, full roar of the surge among the ice reminded them of salmon and reindeer time and the smell of blossoming ground willows. Even as they looked, the sea began to skim over between the floating cakes of ice, so intense was the cold. But on the horizon there was a vast red glare and that was the light of the sunken sun. It was more like hearing him yawn in his sleep than seeing him rise, and the glare only lasted for a few minutes, but it marked the turn of the year. Nothing, they felt, could alter that. Kotuko found the dogs fighting over a fresh-killed seal who was following the fish that a gale always disturbs. He was the first of some twenty or thirty seal that landed on the island in the course of the day, until the sea froze hard, there were hundreds of keen black heads rejoicing in the shallow free water and floating about with the floating ice. It was good to eat seal liver again, to fill the lamps recklessly with blubber and watch the flame blaze three feet in the air. But as soon as the new sea ice bore, Kotuko and the girl loaded the hand sleigh and made the two dogs pull as they had never pulled in their lives, for they feared what might have happened in their village. The weather was pitiless as usual, but it is easier to draw a sleigh loaded with good food than to hunt starving. They left five and twenty seal carcasses buried in the ice of the beach, all ready for use, and hurried back to their people. The dogs showed them the way as soon as Kotuko told them what was expected, and though there was no sign of a landmark, in two days they were giving tongue outside Kadlu's house. Only three dogs answered them. The others had been eaten, and the houses were all dark. But when Kotuko shouted, Ojo, boiled meat, weak voices replied, and when he called the muster of the village name by name very distinctly, there were no gaps in it. An hour later, the lamps blazed in Kadlo's house. Snow water was heating, the pots were beginning to simmer, and the snow was dripping from the roof as Amarak made ready a meal for all the village, and the boy baby in the hood chewed at a strip of rich nutty blubber and the hunters slowly and methodically filled themselves to the very brim with seal meat. Kotuko and the girl told their tale. The two dogs sat between them, and whenever their names came in, they cocked an ear apiece and looked most thoroughly ashamed of themselves. A dog who has once gone mad and recovered, the Inuit say, is safe against all further attacks. So the Tornak did not forget us, said Kotuko. The storm blew, the ice broke, and the seal swam in behind the fish that were frightened by the storm. Now the new seal holes are not two days distant. Let the good hunters go tomorrow and bring back the seal I have speared. Twenty-five seal buried in the ice. 
When we have eaten those, we will all follow the seal on the floor. What do you do? said the sorcerer, in the same sort of voice as he used to Cadlo, richest of the Tunanimur. Katuko looked at the girl from the north and said quietly, We build a house. He pointed to the northwest side of Cadlo's house, for that is the side on which the married son or daughter always lives. The girl turned her hands palm upward with a little despairing shake of her head. She was a foreigner, picked up starving, and could bring nothing to the housekeeping. Amarak jumped from the bench where she sat and began to sweep things into the girl's lap. Stone lamps, iron skin scrapers, tin kettles, deer skins embroidered with muskox teeth and real canvas needles such as sailors use, the finest dowry that has ever been given on the far edge of the Arctic Circle. And the girl from the north bowed her head down to the very floor. Also these, said Kotuko, laughing and signing to the dogs, who thrust their cold muzzles into the girl's face. Ah, said the angercock, with an important cough, as though he had been thinking it all over. As soon as Kotuko left the village, I went to the singing house and sang magic. I sang all the long nights and called upon the spirit of the reindeer. My singing made the gale blow that broke the ice and drew the two dogs toward Kotuko when the ice would have crushed his bones. My song drew the seal in behind the broken ice. My body lay still in the quaggi, but my spirit ran about on the ice and guided Kotuko and the dogs in all the things they did. I did it. Everybody was full and sleepy, so no one contradicted, and the angercock, by virtue of his office, helped himself to yet another lump of boiled meat and lay down to sleep with the others in the warm, well-lighted, oil-smelling home. Now Kotuko, who drew very well in the Inuit fashion, scratched pictures of all these adventures on a long, flat piece of ivory with a hole at one end. When he and the girl went north to Ellesmere land, in the year of the wonderful open winter, he left the picture story with Kadlu, who lost it in the shingle when his dog sleigh broke down one summer on the beach of Lake Netilling at Nikosirin. And there a Lake Inuit found it next spring and sold it to a man at Imogen, who was interpreter on a Cumberland Sound whaler, and he sold it to Hans Olsen, who was afterward a quartermaster on board a big steamer that took tourists to the North Cape in Norway. When the tourist season was over, the steamer ran between London and Australia, stopping at Ceylon. And there Olsen sold the ivory to a Singalese jeweller for two imitation sapphires. I found it under some rubbish in a house at Colombo, and have translated it from one end to the other. Angutivan Tina This is a very free translation of the Song of the Returning Hunter, as the men used to sing it after seal-spearing. The Inuit always repeat things over and over again. Our gloves are stiff with the frozen blood, our furs with the drifted snow, as we come in with the seal, the seal, in from the edge of the flow. Our jana, awa, oha, hak, and the yelping dog-teams go, and the long whips crack, and the men come back, back from the edge of the flow. We tracked our seal to his secret place, we heard him scratch below, we made our mark and we watched beside, out on the edge of the flow. We raised our lance when he rose to breathe, we drove it downward, so, and we played him thus and we killed him thus, out on the edge of the flow. Our gloves are glued with the frozen blood, our eyes with the drifting snow, but we come back to our wives again, back from the edge of the flow. Our jana, awa, oha, hak, and the loaded dog teams go, and the wives can hear their men come back, back from the edge of the flow. Red Dog For our white and our excellent knights, for the knights of swift running, fair ranging, far seeing, good hunting, sure cunning, for the smells of the dawning, untainted, ere dew has departed, for the rush through the mist and the quarry blind started, for the cry of our mates when the sambo has wheeled and is standing at bay, for the risk and the riot of night, for the sleep at the lair mouth by day, it is met and we go to the fight. Bay, oh, bay. Red Dog It was after the letting in of the jungle that the pleasantest part of Mowgli's life began. 
He had the good conscience that comes from paying debts. All the jungle was his friend, and just a little afraid of him. The things that he did and saw and heard when he was wandering from one people to another, with or without his four companions, would make many stories, each as long as this one. So you will never be told how he met the mad elephant of Mandla, who killed two and twenty bullocks drawing eleven carts of coined silver to the government treasury and scattered the shiny rupees in the dust. How he fought Jakala the crocodile all one long night in the marshes of the north and broke his skinning knife on the brute's backplate. How he found a new and longer knife round the neck of a man who had been killed by a wild boar, and how he tracked that boar and killed him as a fair price for the knife. How he was caught up once in the great famine by the moving of the deer, and nearly crushed to death in the swaying hot herds. How he saved Hathi the silent from being once more trapped in a pit with a stake at the bottom. And how, next day, he himself fell into a very cunning leopard trap, and how Hathi broke the thick wooden bars to pieces above him, how he milked the wild buffaloes in the swamp, and how... But we must tell one tale at a time. Father and Mother Wolf died, and Mowgli rolled a big boulder against the mouth of their cave and cried the death song over them. Baloo grew very old and stiff, and even Bagheera, whose nerves were steel and whose muscles were iron, was a shade slower on the kill than he had been. Akela turned from grey to milky white with pure age, his ribs stuck out, and he walked as though he had been made of wood, and Mowgli killed for him. But the young wolves, the children of the disbanded Sioni pack, throve and increased, and when there were about forty of them, masterless, full-voiced, clean-footed five-year-olds, Akela told them that they ought to gather themselves together and follow the law, and run under one head, as befitted the free people. This was not a question in which Mowgli concerned himself, for, as he said, he had eaten sour fruit, and he knew the tree it hung from. But when Fao, son of Faona, his father was the great tracker in the days of Akela's leadership, fought his way to the leadership of the pack, according to jungle law, and the old calls and songs began to ring under the stars once more, Mowgli came to the Council Rock for memory's sake. When he chose to speak, the pack waited till he had finished, and he sat at Akela's side on the rock above Fowl. Those were the days of good hunting and good sleeping. No stranger cared to break into the jungles that belonged to Mowgli's people, as they called the pack, and the young wolves grew fat and strong, and there were many cubs to bring to the looking over. Mowgli always attended a looking over, remembering the night when a black panther brought a naked brown baby into the pack, and the long call, Look, look well, O wolves, made his heart flutter. Otherwise, he would be far away in the jungle with his four brothers, tasting, touching, seeing, and feeling new things. One twilight, when he was trotting leisurely across the ranges to give Akela the half of a buck that he had killed, while the four jogged behind him, sparring a little and tumbling one another over for joy of being alive, he heard a cry that had never been heard since the bad days of Shere Khan. It was what they call in the jungle the fial, a hideous kind of shriek that the jackal gives when he is hunting behind a tiger, or when there is a big killing afoot. If you can imagine a mixture of hate, triumph, fear, and despair, with a kind of leer running through it, you will get some notion of the fial that rose and sank and wavered and quavered far away across the Wengunga. The four stopped at once, bristling and growling. Mowgli's hand went to his knife, and he checked, the blood in his face, his eyebrows knotted. There is no striped one dare kill here, he said. That is not the cry of the forerunner, answered Grey Brother. It is some great killing. Listen. It broke out again, half sobbing and half chuckling, just as though the jackal had soft human lips. Then Mowgli drew deep breath and ran to the council rock, overtaking on his way hurrying wolves of the pack. Fao and Akela were on the rock together, and below them, every nerve strained, sat the others. The mothers and the cubs were cantering off to their lairs, for when the fial cries, it is no time for weak things to be abroad. They could hear nothing except the Wengunga rushing and gurgling in the dark, and the light evening winds among the treetops, till suddenly across the river a wolf called. It was no wolf of the pack, for they were all at the rock. 
The note changed to a long, despairing bay, and Dole, it said, Dole, Dole, Dole. They heard tired feet on the rocks, and a gaunt wolf, streaked with red on his flanks, his right forepaw useless, and his jaws white with foam, flung himself into the circle and lay gasping at Mowgli's feet. Good hunting. Under whose headship? said Fowl gravely. Good hunting. One taller am I, was the answer. He meant that he was a solitary wolf, fending for himself, his mate, and his cubs in some lonely lair, as do many wolves in the south. One taller means an outlier, one who lies out from any pack. Then he panted, and they could see his heartbeats shake him backward and forward. What moves? said Fowl. For that is the question all the jungle asks after the fiel cries. The dole, the dole of the Deccan, Red Dog, the killer. They came north from the south, saying the Deccan was empty and killing out by the way. When this moon was new, there were four to me, my mate and three cubs. She would teach them to kill on the grass plains, hiding to drive the buck, as we do who are of the open. At midnight I heard them together, full tongue on the trail. At the dawn wind I found them stiff in the grass, four free people, four when this moon was new. Then sought I my blood right and found the dole. How many? said Mowgli quickly. The pack growled deep in their throats. I do not know. Three of them will kill no more, but at the last they drove me like the buck. On my three legs they drove me. Look, free people. He thrust out his mangled forefoot, all dark with dried blood. There were cruel bites low down on his side, and his throat was torn and worried. Eat, said Akela, rising up from the meat Mowgli had brought him, and the outlier flung himself on it. This shall be no loss, he said humbly, when he had taken off the first edge of his hunger. Give me a little strength, free people, and I also will kill. My lair is empty that was full when this moon was new, and the blood debt is not all paid. Fowl heard his teeth crack on a haunch bone and grunted approvingly. We shall need those jaws, said he. Were there cubs with the dole? Nay, nay, red hunters all, grown dogs of their pack, heavy and strong, for all that they eat lizards in the Deccan. What Wantala had said meant that the dole, the red hunting dog of the Deccan, was moving to kill, and the pack knew well that even the tiger will surrender a new kill to the dole. They drive straight through the jungle, and what they meet they pull down and tear to pieces. Though they are not as big nor half as cunning as the wolf, they are very strong and very numerous. The dole, for instance, do not begin to call themselves a pack till they are a hundred strong, whereas forty wolves make a very fair pack indeed. Mowgli's wanderings had taken him to the edge of the high grassy downs of the Deccan, and he had seen the fearless doles sleeping and playing and scratching themselves in the little hollows and tussocks that they use for lairs. He despised and hated them, because they did not smell like the free people, because they did not live in caves, and above all, because they had hair between their toes, while he and his friends were clean-footed. But he knew, for Hathi had told him, what a terrible thing a dole hunting pack was. Even Hathi moves aside from their line, and until they are killed or till game is scarce, they will go forward. Akela knew something of the doles too, for he said to Mowgli quietly, It is better to die in a full pack than leaderless and alone. This is good hunting and my last. But as men live, thou hast very many more nights and days, little brother. Go north and lie down, and if any live after the dole has gone by, he shall bring thee word of the fight. Ah, said Mowgli quite gravely, must I go to the marshes and catch little fish and sleep in a tree, or must I ask help of the bandalog and crack nuts while the pack fight below? It is to the death, said Akela. Thou hast never met the dole, the red killer, even the striped one. Aoa, aoa, said Mowgli pettingly. I have killed one striped ape, and sure am I in my stomach that Shere Khan would have left his own mate for meat to the dole if he had winded a pack across three ranges. Listen now. There was a wolf, my father, and there was a wolf, my mother, and there was an old grey wolf, not too wise, he is white now, was my father and my mother. Therefore I, 
he raised his voice. I say that when the dole come, and if the dole come, Mowgli and the free people are of one skin for that hunting. And I say by the bull that bought me, by the bull Bagheera paid for me in the old days which ye of the pack do not remember. I say that the trees and the river may hear and hold fast if I forget. I say that this my knife shall be as a tooth to the pack, and I do not think it is so blunt. This is my word which has gone from me. Thou dost not know the dole man with a wolf's tongue, said one toller. I look only to clear the blood debt against them, ere they have me in many pieces. They move slowly, killing out as they go, but in two days a little strength will come back to me, and I turn again for the blood debt. But for ye, free people, my word is that ye go north and eat but little for a while till the dole are gone. There is no meat in this hunting. Hear the outlier, said Mowgli with a laugh. Free people, we must go north and dig lizards and rats from the bank, lest by any chance we meet the dole. He must kill out our hunting grounds, while we lie hid in the north till it please him to give us our own again. He is a dog, and the pup of a dog, red, yellow-bellied, lairless, and haired between every toe. He counts his cubs six and eight at the litter, as though he were Chikai, the little leaping rat. Surely we must run away, free people, and beg leave of the peoples of the north for the offal of dead cattle. You know the saying, North are the vermin, south are the lice, we are the jungle. Choose ye, O oh, choose. It is good hunting, for the pack, for the full pack, for the lair and the litter, for the in-kill and the out-kill, for the mate that drives the doe and the little, little cub within the cave. It is met, it is met, it is met. The pack answered with one deep crashing bark that sounded in the night like a big tree falling. It is met, they cried. Stay with these, said Mowgli to the four. We shall need every tooth. Fau and Akela must make ready the battle. I go to count the dogs. It is death, Montala cried, half rising. What can such a hairless one do against the red dog? Even the striped one, remember? Thou art indeed an outlier, Mowgli called back. But we will speak when the doles are dead. Good hunting all. He hurried off into the darkness, wild with excitement, hardly looking where he set foot, and the natural consequence was that he tripped full length over Carr's great coils, where the python lay watching a deer park near the river. Ksha, said Carr angrily. Is this jungle work, to stamp and tramp and undo a night's hunting, when the game are moving so well, too? The fault was mine, said Mowgli, picking himself up. Indeed, I was seeking thee, Flathead. But each time we meet thou art longer and broader by the length of my arm. There is none like thee in the jungle, wise, old, strong, and most beautiful Ka. Now whither does this trail lead? Ka's voice was gentler. Not a moon since there was a manling with a knife threw stones at my head and called me bad little tree-cat names because I lay asleep in the open. Aye and turned every driven deer to all the winds, and Mowgli was hunting, and this same flathead was too deaf to hear his whistle and leave the deer roads free. Mowgli answered composedly, sitting down among the painted coils. Now this same manling comes with soft tickling words to this same flathead, telling him that he is wise and strong and beautiful, and this same old flathead believes and makes a place thus for this same stone-throwing manling, and art thou at ease now? Could Bagheera give thee so good a resting place? Ka had, as usual, made a sort of soft half-hammock of himself under Mowgli's weight. The boy reached out in the darkness and gathered in the supple cable-like neck till Ka's head rested on his shoulder, and then he told him all that had happened in the jungle that night. Wise I may be, said Ka at the end, but deaf I surely am, else I should have heard the fear. Small wonder the eaters of grass are uneasy. How many be the dole? I have not yet seen. I came hotfoot to thee. Thou art older than Hathi, but, oh, Ka! Here Mowgli wriggled with sheer joy. It will be good hunting. Few of us will see another moon. Dost thou strike in this? Remember thou art a man, and remember what pack cast thee out. Let the wolf look to the dog. Thou art a man. Last year's nuts are this year's black earth, said Mowgli. It is true that I am a man, but it is in my stomach that this night I have said that I am a wolf. I called the river and the trees to remember. I am of the free people, Ka, till the dole has gone by. Free people, Ka grunted. Free thieves. 
and thou hast tied thyself into the death knot for the sake of the memory of the dead wolves, this is no good hunting. It is my word which I have spoken. The trees know, the river knows. Till the dole have gone by, my word comes not back to me. Ngsh! This changes all trails. I had thought to take thee away with me to the northern marshes, but the word, even the word of a little naked, hairless manling, is the word. Now I, Ka, say, Think well, Flathead, lest thou tie thyself into the death knot also. I need no word from thee, for well I know. Be it so, then, said Ka. I will give no word. But what is in thy stomach to do when the dole come? They must swim the Wengonga. I thought to meet them with my knife in the shallows, the pack behind me, and so stabbing and thrusting, we a little might turn them downstream or cool their throats. The dole do not turn, and their throats are hot, said Ka. There will be neither manling nor wolf cub when that hunting is done, but only dry bones. Alala, if we die, we die. It will be most good hunting. But my stomach is young, and I have not seen many rains. I am not wise nor strong. Hast thou a better plan, Ka? I have seen a hundred and a hundred rains. Ere Hathi cast his milk tushes, my trail was big in the dust. By the first egg I am older than many trees, and I have seen all that the jungle has done. But this is new hunting, said Mowgli. Never before have the dole crossed our trail. What is has been. What will be is no more than a forgotten year striking backward. Be still while I count those my years. For a long hour Mowgli lay back among the coils, while Ka, his head motionless on the ground, thought of all that he had seen and known since the day he came from the egg. The light seemed to go out of his eyes and leave them like stale opals, and now and again he made little stiff passes with his head right and left, as though he were hunting in his sleep. Mowgli dozed quietly, for he knew that there is nothing like sleep before hunting, and he was trained to take it at any hour of the day or night. Then he felt Ka's back grow bigger and broader below him, as the huge python puffed himself out, hissing with the noise of a sword drawn from a steel scabbard. I have seen all the dead seasons, Ka said at last, and the great trees and the old elephants, and the rocks that were bare and sharp pointed ere the moss grew. Art thou still alive, Manly? It is only a little after moonset, said Mowgli. I do not understand. Shh! I am again Ka. I knew it was but a little time. Now we will go to the river, and I will show thee what is to be done against the dole. He turned, straight as an arrow, for the main stream of the Wengunga, plunging in a little above the pool that hid the peace rock, Mowgli at his side. Nay, do not swim. I go swiftly. My back, little brother. Mowgli tucked his left arm round Ka's neck, dropped his right close to his body, and straightened his feet. Then Ka breasted the current as he alone could, and the ripple of the checked water stood up in a frill round Mowgli's neck, and his feet were waved to and fro in the eddy under the python's lashing sides. A mile or two above the peace rock, the Wengunga narrows between a gorge of marble rocks from eighty to a hundred feet high, and the current runs like a mill-race between and over all manner of ugly stones. But Mowgli did not trouble his head about the water, Little water in the world could have given him a moment's fear. He was looking at the gorge on either side and sniffing uneasily, for there was a sweetish, sourish smell in the air, very like the smell of a big ant hill on a hot day. Instinctively, he lowered himself in the water, only raising his head to breathe from time to time, and Carr came to anchor with a double twist of his tail round a sunken rock, holding Mowgli in the hollow of a coil while the water raced on. This is the place of death, said the boy. Why do we come here? They sleep, said Ka. Hathi will not turn aside for the striped one. Yet Hathi and the striped one together turn aside for the dole, and a dole they say turn aside for nothing. And yet for whom do the little people of the rocks turn aside? Tell me, master of the jungle, who is the master of the jungle? These, Mowgli whispered. It is the place of death. Let us go. Nay, look well, for they are asleep. It is as it was when I was not the length of thy arm. The split and weather-worn rocks of the gorge of the Wengunga 
had been used since the beginning of the jungle by the little people of the rocks, the busy, furious, black wild bees of India. And, as Mowgli knew well, all trails turned off half a mile before they reached the gorge. For centuries the little people had hived and swarmed from cleft to cleft, and swarmed again, staining the white marble with stale honey, and made their combs tall and deep in the dark of the inner caves, where neither man nor beast nor fire nor water had ever touched them. The length of the gorge on both sides was hung, as it were, with black, shimmery, velvet curtains, and Mowgli sank as he looked, for those were the clotted millions of the sleeping bees. There were other lumps and festoons, and things like decayed tree trunks studded on the face of the rock, the old combs of past years, or new cities built in the shadow of the windless gorge, and huge masses of spongy, rotten trash had rolled down and stuck among the trees and creepers that clung to the rock face. As he listened, he heard more than once the rustle and slide of a honey-loaded comb turning over or falling away somewhere in the dark gallery then a booming of angry wings, and the sullen drip, drip, drip of the wasted honey, guttering along till it lipped over some ledge in the open air, and sluggishly trickled down on the twigs. There was a tiny little beach, not five feet broad, on one side of the river, and that was piled high with the rubbish of uncounted years. There were dead bees, drones, sweepings and stale combs, and wings of marauding moths that had strayed in after honey, all tumbled in smooth piles of the finest black dust. The mere sharp smell of it was enough to frighten anything that had no wings, and knew what the little people were. Carr moved upstream again, till he came to a sandy bar at the head of the gorge. Here is this season's kill, said he. Look. On the bank lay the skeletons of a couple of young deer and buffalo. Mowgli could see that neither wolf nor jackal had touched the bones, which were laid out naturally. They came beyond the line. They did not know the law, murmured Mowgli, and the little people killed them. Let us go ere they wake. They do not wake till the dawn, said Carr. Now I will tell you. A hunted buck from the south, many, many rains ago, came hither from the south, not knowing the jungle, a pack on his trail. Being made blind by fear, he leaped from above, the pack running by sight, for they were hot and blind on the trail. The sun was high, and the little people were many and very angry. Many, too, were those of the pack who leaped into the Wangunga, but they were dead ere they took the water. Those who did not leap died also in the rocks above, but the buck lived. How? Because he came first, running for his life, leaping ere the little people were aware, and was in the river when they gathered to kill. The pack following was altogether lost under the weight of the little people. The buck lived, Mowgli repeated slowly. At least he did not die then, though none waited his coming down with a strong body to hold him safe against the water, as a certain old fat, deaf, yellow flathead would wait for a manling. Yea, though there were all the dolls of the Deccan on his trail. What is in thy stomach? Car's head was close to Mowgli's ear, and it was a little time before the boy answered. It is to pull the very whiskers of death, but, Ka, thou art indeed the wisest of all the jungle. So many have said. Look now, if the dole follow thee, as surely they will follow, ho, oh, oh, I have many little thorns under my tongue to prick into their hides. If they follow thee, hot and blind, looking only at thy shoulders, those who do not die up above will take water, either here or lower down, for the little people will rise up and cover them. Now the Wingunga is hungry water, and they will have no car to hold them, but will go down, such as live, to the shallows by the Sioni lairs, and there thy pack may meet them by the throat. Ahai! Iowawa! Better could not be till the rains fall in the dry season. There is now only the little matter of the run and the leap. I will make me known to the dolls, so that they shall follow me very closely. Hast thou seen the rocks above thee, from the landward side? Indeed, no. That I had forgotten. Go look. It is all rotten ground, cut and full of holes. One of thy clumsy feet set down without seeing would end the hunt. See, I leave thee here, and for thy sake only will I carry word to the pack, that they may know where to look for the dolls. For myself, 
I am not of one skin with any wolf. When Carr disliked an acquaintance, he could be more unpleasant than any of the jungle people, except perhaps Bagheera. He swam downstream, and opposite the rock he came on Fao and Akela listening to the night noises. Shh, dogs, he said cheerfully. The doles will come downstream. If ye be not afraid, ye can kill them in the shallows. When come they? said Fao. And where is my man cub? said Akela. They come when they come, said Ka. Wait and see. As for thy man cub, from whom thou hast taken a word and so laid him open to death, thy man cub is with me. And if he be not already dead, the fault is not of thine, bleached dog. Wait here for the dole, and be glad that the man cub and I strike on thy side. He flashed upstream again, and moored himself in the middle of the gorge, looking upward at the line of the cliff. Presently he saw Mowgli's head move against the stars, and then there was a whiz in the air, and the keen, clean shloop of a body falling feet first, and the next minute the boy was at rest again in the loop of Carr's body. "'It is no leap by night,' said Mowgli quietly. "'I have jumped twice as far for sport. But that is an evil place above, low bushes and gullies that go down very deep, all full of the little people.' I have put big stones one above the other by the side of three gullies. These I shall throw down with my feet in running, and the little people will rise up behind me, very angry. That is man's talk and man's cunning, said Carr. Thou art wise, but the little people are always angry. Nay, at twilight all wings near and far rest for a while. I will play with the dole at twilight, for the dole hunts best by day. He follows now Wantala's blood trail. Chill does not leave a dead ox, nor the dole the blood trail, said Carr. Then I will make him a new blood trail, of his own blood, if I can, and give him dirt to eat. Thou wilt stay here, Carr, till I come again with my doles? Aye, but what if they kill thee in the jungle, or the little people kill thee before thou canst leap down into the river? When tomorrow comes, we will kill for tomorrow, said Mowgli, quoting a jungle saying, and again, when I am dead, it is time to sing the death song. Good hunting, Ka. He loosed his arm from the python's neck and went down the gorge like a log in a freshet, paddling toward the far bank, where he found slack water, and laughing aloud from sheer happiness. There was nothing Mowgli liked better than, as he himself said, to pull the whiskers of death and make the jungle know that he was their overlord. He had often, with Baloo's help, robbed bees' nests in single trees, and he knew that the little people hated the smell of wild garlic. So he gathered a small bundle of it, tied it up with a bark string, and then followed Wantala's blood trail as it ran southerly from the lairs for some five miles, looking at the trees with his head on one side and chuckling as he looked. Mowgli the frog have I been, said he to himself. Mowgli the wolf have I said that I am. Now Mowgli the ape must I be before I am Mowgli the buck. At the end I shall be Mowgli the man. Ho! And he slid his thumb along the eighteen-inch blade of his knife. Wantala's trail, all rank with dark blood spots, ran under a forest of thick trees that grew close together and stretched away northeastward, gradually growing thinner and thinner to within two miles of the bee rocks. From the last tree to the low scrub of the bee rocks was open country, where there was hardly cover enough to hide a wolf. Mowgli trotted along under the trees, judging distances between branch and branch, occasionally climbing up a trunk and taking a trial leap from one tree to another, till he came to the open ground, which he studied very carefully for an hour. Then he turned, picked up Wantala's trail where he had left it, settled himself in a tree with an outrunning branch some eight feet from the ground, and sat still sharpening his knife on the sole of his foot and singing to himself. A little before midday, when the sun was very warm, he heard the patter of feet and smelt the abominable smell of the dole pack as they trotted pitilessly along Wantala's trail. Seen from above, the red dole does not look half the size of a wolf, but Mowgli knew how strong his feet and jaws were. He watched the sharp bay head of the leader snuffing along the trail and gave him, Good hunting! The brute looked up, and his companions halted behind him, scores and scores of red dogs with low-hung tails, heavy shoulders, weak quarters, and bloody mouths. 
The dolls are a silent people as a rule, and they have no manners even in their own jungle. Fully two hundred must have gathered below him, but he could see that the leaders sniffed hungrily on Wontala's trail and tried to drag the pack forward. That would never do, or they would be at the lairs in broad daylight, and Mowgli intended to hold them under his tree till dusk. "'By whose leave do ye come here?' said Mowgli. "'Doll jungles are our jungle,' was the reply, and the doll that gave it bared his white teeth. Mowgli looked down with a smile, and imitated perfectly the sharp chitter-chatter of the chikai, the leaping rat of the Deccan, meaning the dolls to understand that he considered them no better than chikai. The pack closed up round the tree trunk, and the leader bayed savagely, calling Mowgli a tree ape. For all answer, Mowgli stretched down one naked leg and wriggled his bare toes just above the leader's head. That was enough, and more than enough, to wake the pack to stupid rage. Those who have hair between their toes do not care to be reminded of it. Mowgli caught his foot away as the leader leaped up and said sweetly, Dog, red dog, go back to the Deccan and eat lizards. Go to Chikai, thy brother. Dog, dog, red, red dog, there is hair between every toe. He twiddled his toes a second time. Come down ere we starve thee out, hairless ape, yelled the pack. And this was exactly what Mowgli wanted. He laid himself down along the branch, his cheek to the bark, his right arm free, and there he told the pack what he thought and knew about them, their manners, their customs, their mates, and their puppies. There is no speech in the world so rancorous and so stinging as the language the jungle people use to show scorn and contempt. When you come to think of it, you will see how this must be so. As Mowgli told Ka, he had many little thorns under his tongue and slowly and deliberately he drove the dolls from silence to growls, from growls to yells, and from yells to hoarse, slavery raving. They tried to answer his taunts, but a cub might as well have tried to answer Ka in a rage. And all the while Mowgli's right hand lay crooked at his side, ready for action, his feet locked round the branch. The big bay leader had leaped many times in the air, but Mowgli dared not risk a false blow. At last, Made furious beyond his natural strength, he bounded up seven or eight feet clear of the ground. Then Mowgli's hand shot out like the head of a tree snake and gripped him by the scruff of his neck, and the branch shook with the jar as his weight fell back, almost wrenching Mowgli to the ground. But he never loosed his grasp, and inch by inch he hauled the beast, hanging like a drowned jackal up on the branch. With his left hand he reached for his knife and cut off the red, bushy tail, flinging the doll back to earth again. That was all he needed. The pack would not go forward on Wontala's trail now till they had killed Mowgli, or Mowgli had killed them. He saw them settle down in circles with a quiver of the haunches that meant they were going to stay, and so he climbed to a higher crotch, settled his back comfortably, and went to sleep. After four or five hours, he waked and counted the pack. They were all there, silent, husky, and dry, with eyes of steel. The sun was beginning to sink. In half an hour, the little people of the rocks would be ending their labours, and, as he knew, the dole does not fight best in the twilight. I did not need such faithful watchers, he said politely, standing up on a branch, but I will remember this. Ye be true doles, but, to my thinking, over much of one kind. For that reason, I do not give the big lizard-eater his tail again. Art thou not pleased, Red Dog? I myself will tear out thy stomach, yelled the leader, scratching at the foot of the tree. Nay, but consider, wise rat of the Deccan, there will now be many litters of little tailless red dogs, yea, with raw red stumps that sting when the sand is hot. Go home, Red Dog, and cry that an ape has done this. You will not go? Come then with me, and I will make you very wise. He moved, bandalog fashion, into the next tree, and so on into the next and the next, the pack following with lifted hungry heads. Now and then he would pretend to fall, and the pack would tumble one over the other in their haste to be at the death. It was a curious sight, the boy with the knife that shone in the low sunlight as it shifted through the upper branches, and the silent pack with their red coats all aflame, huddling and following below. When he came to the last tree, he took the garlic and rubbed himself all over carefully, 
and the dolls yelled with scorn. Ape with a wolf's tongue, dost thou think to cover thy scent? They said, we follow to the death. Take thy tail, said Mowgli, flinging it back along the course he had taken. The pack instinctively rushed after it. And follow now, to the death. He had slipped down the tree trunk and headed like the wind in bare feet for the bee rocks before the dolls saw what he would do. They gave one deep howl and settled down to the long, lobbing canter that can at last run down anything that runs. Mowgli knew their pack pace to be much slower than that of the wolves, or he would have never risked a two-mile run in full sight. They were sure that the boy was theirs at last, and he was sure that he held them to play with as he pleased. All his trouble was to keep them sufficiently hot behind him to prevent their turning off too soon. He ran cleanly, evenly, and springily, the tailless leader not five yards behind him, and the pack tailing out over perhaps a quarter of a mile of ground, crazy and blind with the rage of slaughter. So he kept his distance by ear, reserving his last effort for the rush across the bee rocks. The little people had gone to sleep in the early twilight, for it was not the season of late blossoming flowers. But as Mowgli's first footfalls rang hollow on the hollow ground, he heard a sound as though all the earth were humming and he ran as he had never run in his life before, spurned aside one, two, three of the piles of stones into the dark, sweet-smelling gullies, heard a roar like the roar of the sea in a cave, saw with the tail of his eye the air grow dark behind him, saw the current of the Wengunga far below, and a flat, diamond-shaped head in the water, leaped outward with all his strength, the tailless stole snapping at his shoulder in mid-air, and dropped feet first to the safety of the river, breathless and triumphant. There was not a sting upon him, for the smell of the garlic had checked the little people for just the few seconds that he was among them. When he rose, Kaa's coils were steadying him, and things were bounding over the edge of the cliff, great lumps, it seemed, of clustered bees falling like plummets. But before any lump touched water, the bees flew upward, and the body of a doll whirled downstream. Overhead, they could hear furious short yells that were drowned in a roar like breakers, the roar of the wings of the little people of the rocks. Some of the doles, too, had fallen into the gullies that communicated with the underground caves, and there choked and fought and snapped among the tumbled honeycombs, and at last, borne up even when they were dead on the heaving waves of bees beneath them, shot out of some hole in the river face to roll over on the black rubbish heaps. There were doles who had leaped short into the trees on the cliffs, and the bees blotted out their shapes. But the greater number of them, maddened by the stings, had flung themselves into the river, and, as Ka said, the Wengunga was hungry water. Ka held Mowgli fast till the boy had recovered his breath. We may not stay here, he said. The little people are roused indeed. Come. Swimming low and diving as often as he could, Mowgli went down the river, knife in hand. Slowly, slowly, said Ka. One tooth does not kill a hundred unless it be a cobra's and many of the dolls took water swiftly when they saw the little people rise. The more work for my knife, then. Fie! How the little people follow! Mowgli sank again. The face of the water was blanketed with wild bees, buzzing sullenly and stinging all they found. Nothing was ever yet lost by silence, said Carr. No sting could penetrate his scales, and thou hast all the long night for the hunting. Hear them howl. Nearly half the pack had seen the trap their fellows rushed into, and, turning sharp aside, had flung themselves into the water where the gorge broke down in steep banks. Their cries of rage and their threats against the tree ape who had brought them to their shame mixed with the yells and growls of those who had been punished by the little people. To remain ashore was death, and every dole knew it. Their pack was swept along the current, down to the deep eddies of the peace pool, but even there the angry little people followed and forced them to the water again. Mowgli could hear the voice of the tailless leader bidding his people hold on and kill out every wolf in Sioni, but he did not waste his time in listening. One kills in the dark behind us, snapped a dole. Here is tainted water. Mowgli had dived forward like an otter, twitched a struggling dole underwater before he could open his mouth, and dark rings rose as the body plopped up, turning on its side. The dolls tried to turn, but the current prevented them. 
and the little people darted at their heads and ears, and they could hear the challenge of the Sioni pack growing louder and deeper in the gathering darkness. Again Mowgli dived, and again a dole went under and rose dead, and again the clamour broke out at the rear of the pack, some howling that it was best to go ashore, others calling on their leader to lead them back to the Deccan, and others bidding Mowgli show himself and be killed. They come to the fight with two stomachs and several voices, said Kaa. The rest is with thy brethren below yonder. The little people go back to sleep. They have chased us far. Now I, too, turn back, for I am not of one skin with any wolf. Good hunting, little brother, and remember the dole bites low. A wolf came running along the bank on three legs, leaping up and down, laying his head sideways close to the ground, hunching his back and breaking high into the air as though he were playing with his cubs. It was one toller, the outlier, and he never said a word, but continued his horrible sport beside the doles. They had been long in the water now, and were swimming wearily, their coats drenched and heavy, their bushy tails dragging like sponges, so tired and shaken that they too were silent, watching the pair of blazing eyes that moved abreast. This is no good hunting, said one, panting. Good hunting, said Mowgli, as he rose boldly at the brute's side and sent the long knife home behind the shoulder, pushing hard to avoid his dying snap. Art thou there, man-cub? said one toller across the river. Ask the dead, outlier, Mowgli replied. Have none come downstream? I have filled these dogs' mouths with dirt. I have tricked them in the broad daylight, and their leader lacks his tail. But here be some few for thee still. Whither shall I drive them? I will wait, said Wantala. The night is before me. Nearer and nearer came the bay of the Sioni wolves. For the pack, for the full pack, it is met. And a bend in the river drove the doles forward among the sands and shoals opposite the lairs. Then they saw their mistake. They should have landed half a mile higher up and rushed the wolves on dry ground. Now it was too late. The bank was lined with burning eyes, and except for the horrible fial that had never stopped since sundown, there was no sound in the jungle. It seemed as though one Tolla were fawning on them to come ashore, and, "'Turn and take hold!' said the leader of the doles. The entire pack flung themselves at the shore, threshing and squattering through the shoal water, till the face of the Wingunga was all white and torn, and the great ripples went from side to side like bow waves from a boat. Mowgli followed the rush, stabbing and slicing as the doles, huddled together, rushed up the river beach in one wave. Then the long fight began, heaving and straining and splitting and scattering and narrowing and broadening along the red, wet sands and over and between the tangled tree roots and through and among the brushes and in and out of the grass clumps. For even now the doles were two to one. But they met wolves fighting for all that made the pack, and not only the short, high, deep-chested, white-tusked hunters of the pack, but the anxious-eyed lahinis, the she-wolves of the lair, as the saying is, fighting for their litters, with here and there a yearling wolf, his first coat still half-woolly, tugging and grappling by their sides. A wolf, you must know, flies at the throat or snaps at the flank, while a dole, by preference, bites at the belly. So when the doles were struggling out of the water and had to raise their heads, the odds were with the wolves. On dry land the wolves suffered, but in the water or ashore Mowgli's knife came and went without ceasing. The four had worried their way to his side. Grey Brother, crouched between the boy's knees, was protecting his stomach, while the others guarded his back and either side, or stood over him when the shock of a leaping, yelling dole who had thrown himself full on the steady blade bore him down. For the rest, it was one tangled confusion, a locked and swaying mob that moved from right to left and from left to right along the bank, and also ground round and round slowly on its own centre. Here would be a heaving mound, like a water blister in a whirlpool, which would break like a water blister and throw up four or five mangled dogs, each striving to get back to the centre. Here would be a single wolf borne down by two or three doles, laboriously dragging them forward and sinking the while. Here a yearling cub would be held up by the pressure round him, though he had been killed early, while his mother, crazed with dumb rage, rolled over and over, snapping and passing on. 
and in the middle of the thickest press, perhaps, one wolf and one dole, forgetting everything else, would be manoeuvring for first hold, till they were whirled away by a rush of furious fighters. Once Mowgli passed Akela, a dole on either flank, and his all but toothless jaws closed over the loins of a third, and once he saw Fow, his teeth set in the throat of a dole, tugging the unwilling beast forward till the yearlings could finish him. But the bulk of the fight was blind flurry and smother in the dark. Hit, trip and tumble, yelp, groan and worry, worry, worry round him and behind him and above him. As the night wore on, the quick giddy go-round motion increased. The dolls were cowed and afraid to attack the stronger wolves, but did not yet dare to run away. Mowgli felt that the end was coming soon, and contented himself with striking merely to cripple. The yearlings were growing bolder. There was time now and again to breathe and pass a word to a friend, and the mere flicker of the knife would sometimes turn a dog aside. The meat is very near the bone, Grey Brother yelled. He was bleeding from a score of flesh wounds. But the bone is yet to be cracked, said Mowgli. Iowawa! Thus we do in the jungle. The red blade ran like a flame along the side of a dole whose hind quarters were hidden by the weight of a clinging wolf. My kill, snorted the wolf through his wrinkled nostrils. Leave him to me. Is thy stomach still empty, outlier? said Mowgli. Wantala was fearfully punished, but his grip had paralyzed the dole who could not turn round and reach him. By the bull that bought me, said Mowgli with a bitter laugh, it is the tailless one and indeed it was the big bay-coloured leader. It is not wise to kill cubs and lahinis, Mowgli went on philosophically, wiping the blood out of his eyes, unless one has also killed the outlier. And it is in my stomach that this Wantala kills thee. A dole leaped to his leader's aid, but before his teeth had found Wantala's flank, Mowgli's knife was in his throat, and Grey Brother took what was left. And thus we do in the jungle, said Mowgli. Wantala said not a word, only his jaws were closing and closing on the backbone as his life ebbed. The dole shuddered, his head dropped, and he lay still, and Wantala dropped above him. Ha! Huh. The blood debt is paid, said Mowgli. Sing the song, Wantala. He hunts no more, said Grey Brother, and Akela too is silent this long time. The bone is cracked, thundered Fao, son of Faona. They go, kill, kill out, O oh hunters of the free people. Dole after dole was slinking away from those dark and bloody sands to the river, to the thick jungle, upstream or downstream, as he saw the road clear. The debt, the debt, shouted Mowgli. Pay the debt. They have slain the lone wolf. Let not a dog go. He was flying to the river, knife in hand, to check any dole who dared to take water, when, from under a mound of nine dead, rose Akela's red head and forequarters, and Mowgli dropped on his knees beside the lone wolf. Said I not it would be my last fight? Akela panted. It is good hunting. And thou, little brother? I live, having killed many. Even so. I die, and I would... I would die by thee, little brother. Mowgli took the terrible scarred head on his knees and put his arms round the torn neck. It is long since the old days of Shere Khan and a man-cub that rolled naked in the dust. Nay, nay, I am a wolf. I am of one skin with the free people, Mowgli cried. It is no will of mine that I am a man. Thou art a man, little brother, wolfling of my watching. Thou art a man or else the pack had fled before the dole. My life I owe to thee, and today thou hast saved the pack even as once I saved thee. Hast thou forgotten? All debts are paid now. Go to thine own people. I tell thee again, eye of my eye, this hunting is ended. Go to thine own people. I will never go. I will hunt alone in the jungle. I have said it. After the summer come the rains, and after the rains come the spring. Go back before thou art driven. Who will drive me? Mowgli will drive Mowgli. Go back to thy people. Go to man. When Mowgli drives Mowgli, I will go, Mowgli answered. 
There is no more to say, said Akela. Little brother, canst thou raise me to my feet? I also was a leader of the free people. Very carefully and gently, Mowgli lifted the bodies aside and raised Akela to his feet, both arms round him. And the lone wolf drew a long breath and began the death song that a leader of the pack should sing when he dies. It gathered strength as he went on, lifting and lifting and ringing far across the river till it came to the last good hunting. And Akela shook himself clear of Mowgli for an instant, and leaping into the air, fell backward dead upon his last and most terrible kill. Mowgli sat with the head on his knees, careless of anything else, while the remnant of the flying dolls were being overtaken and run down by the merciless Lahinis. Little by little the cries died away, and the wolves returned limping as their wounds stiffened to take stock of the losses. Fifteen of the pack, as well as half a dozen Lahinis, lay dead by the river, and of the others not one was unmarked. And Mowgli sat through it all till the cold daybreak, when Fowl's wet red muzzle was dropped in his hand, and Mowgli drew back to show the gaunt body of Akela. "'Good hunting,' said Fowl, as though Akela were still alive, and then over his bitten shoulder to the others, "'Howl, dogs! A wolf has died tonight!' But of all the pack of two hundred fighting dolls, whose boast was that all jungles were their jungle, and that no living thing could stand before them, not one returned to the Deccan to carry that word. Chill Song This is the song that Chill sang as the kites dropped down one after another to the riverbed when the great fight was finished. Chill is good friends with everybody, but he is a cold-blooded kind of creature at heart because he knows that almost everybody in the jungle comes to him in the long run. These were my companions going forth by night. For Chill, look you, for Chill. Now come I to whistle them the ending of the fight. Chill, vanguards of chill. Word they gave me overhead of the quarry newly slain. Word I gave them underfoot of buck upon the plain. Here's an end of every trail, they shall not speak again. They that called the hunting cry, they that followed fast. For chill, look you, for chill. They that bade the sambo wheel and pinned him as he passed. Chill, vanguards of chill. They that lagged behind the scent, they that ran before. They that shunned the level horn, they that overbore. Here's an end of every trail, they shall not follow more. These were my companions, pity twas they died, For chill, look you, for chill. Now come I to comfort them that knew in their pride. Chill, vanguards of chill. Tattered flank and sunken eye, open mouth and red, Locked and lank and lone they lie, like dead upon their dead. Here's an end of every trail, and here my hosts are fed. The Spring Running Man goes to man, cry the challenge through the jungle. He that was our brother goes away. Hear now and judge, O ye people of the jungle. Answer who shall turn him, who shall stay. Man goes to man, he is weeping in the jungle, he that was our brother sorrows sore. Man goes to man, oh, we loved him in the jungle, to the man-trail where we may not follow more. The Spring Running The second year after the great fight with Red Dog and the death of Akela, Mowgli must have been nearly seventeen years old. He looked older for hard exercise, the best of good eating, and baths whenever he felt in the least hot or dusty, had given him strength and growth far beyond his age. He could swing by one hand from a top branch for half an hour at a time, when he had occasion to look along the tree roads. He could stop a young buck in mid-gallop and throw him sideways by the head. He could even jerk over the big blue wild boars that lived in the marshes of the north. The jungle people who used to fear him for his wits feared him now for his strength, and when he moved quietly on his own affairs, the mere whisper of his coming cleared the woodpaths. And yet the look in his eyes was always gentle. Even when he fought, his eyes never blazed as Bagheera's did. They only grew more and more interested and excited. 
and that was one of the things that Bagheera himself did not understand. He asked Mowgli about it, and the boy laughed and said, When I miss the kill, I am angry. When I must go empty for two days, I am very angry. Do not my eyes talk then? The mouth is angry, said Bagheera, but the eyes say nothing. Hunting, eating, or swimming, it is all one, like a stone in wet or dry weather. Mowgli looked at him lazily from under his long eyelashes, and as usual the panther's head dropped. Bagheera knew his mouth best. They were lying out far up the side of a hill overlooking the Wengunga, and the morning mist hung below them in bands of white and green. As the sun rose, it changed into bubbling seas of red gold, churned off, and let the low rays stripe the dried grass on which Mowgli and Bagheera were resting. It was the end of the cold weather. The leaves and the trees looked worn and faded, and there was a dry ticking rustle everywhere when the wind blew. A little leaf tap-tap-tapped furiously against a twig, as a single leaf caught in a current will. It roused Bagheera, for he snuffed the morning air with a deep, hollow cough, threw himself on his back, and struck with his forepaws at the nodding leaf above. The year turns, he said. The jungle goes forward. The time of new talk is near. That leaf knows. It is very good. The grass is dry, Mowgli answered, pulling up a tuft. Even I of the spring, that is a little trumpet-shaped waxy red flower that runs in and out among the grasses, even I of the spring is shut, and... Bagheera... Is it well for the black panther so to lie on his back and beat with his paws in the air as though he were a tree cat? Ah, oh, said Bagheera. He seemed to be thinking of other things. I say, is it well for the black panther so to mouth and cough and howl and roll? Remember, we be the masters of the jungle, thou and I. Indeed, yes, I hear, man-cub. Bagheera rolled over hurriedly and sat up, the dust on his ragged black flanks. He was just casting his winter coat. We be surely the masters of the jungle. Who is so strong as Mowgli? Who so wise? There was a curious drawl in the voice that made Mowgli turn to see whether by any chance the Black Panther were making fun of him, for the jungle is full of words that sound like one thing but mean another. I said we be beyond question the masters of the jungle, Bagheera repeated. Have I done wrong? I did not know that the man-cub no longer lay upon the ground. Does he fly, then? Mowgli sat with his elbows on his knees, looking out across the valley at the daylight. Somewhere down in the woods below, a bird was trying over in a husky, reedy voice the first few notes of his spring song. It was no more than a shadow of the liquid, tumbling call he would be pouring later, but Bagheera heard it. I said the time of new talk is near, growled the panther, switching his tail. I hear, Mowgli answered. Bakira, why dost thou shake all over? The sun is warm. That is Feral, the scarlet woodpecker, said Bakira. He has not forgotten. Now I too must remember my song. And he began purring and crooning to himself, harking back dissatisfied again and again. There is no game afoot, said Mowgli. Little brother, are both thine ears stopped? That is no killing word, but my song that I make ready against the need. I have forgotten. I shall know when the time of new talk is here, because then thou and the others all run away and leave me alone. Mowgli spoke rather savagely. But indeed, little brother, Bagheera began. We do not always. I say you do, said Mowgli shooting out his forefinger angrily. Ye do run away, and I, who am the master of the jungle, must needs walk alone. How was it last season, when I would gather sugar cane from the fields of a man-pack? I sent a runner, I sent thee, to Hathi, bidding him to come upon such a night and pluck the sweet grass for me with his trunk. He came only two nights later, said Bagheera, cowering a little. And of that long, sweet grass that pleased thee so, he gathered more than any man-cub could eat in all the nights of the rains. That was no fault of mine. He did not come upon the night when I sent him the word. No, he was trumpeting and running and roaring through the valleys in the moonlight. 
His trail was like the trail of three elephants, for he would not hide among the trees. He danced in the moonlight before the houses of the man-pack. I saw him, and yet he would not come to me, and I am the master of the jungle. It was the time of new talk, said the panther, always very humble. Perhaps, little brother, thou didst not that time call him by a master word? Listen to Ferrao and be glad. Mowgli's bad temper seemed to have boiled itself away. He lay back with his head on his arms, his eyes shut. I do not know, nor do I care, he said sleepily. Let us sleep, Bagheera. My stomach is heavy in me. Make me a rest for my head. The panther lay down again with a sigh, because he could hear Ferrao practicing and re-practicing his song against the springtime of new talk, as they say. In an Indian jungle, the seasons slide one into the other almost without division. There seem to be only two, the wet and the dry. But if you look closely below the torrents of rain and the clouds of char and dust, you will find all four going round in their regular ring. Spring is the most wonderful, because she has not to cover a clean bare field with new leaves and flowers, but to drive before her and to put away the hanging-on, over-surviving raffle of half-green things which the gentle winter has suffered to live, and to make the partly-dressed stale earth feel new and young once more. And she does this so well that there is no spring in the world like the jungle spring. There is one day when all things are tired, and the very smells as they drift on the heavy air are old and used. One cannot explain this, but it feels so. Then there is another day. To the eye nothing whatever has changed, when all the smells are new and delightful, and the whiskers of the jungle people quiver to their roots, and the winter hair comes away from their sides in long, draggled locks. Then, perhaps, a little rain falls and all the trees and the bushes and the bamboos and the mosses and the juicy-leaved plants wake with a noise of growing that you can almost hear. And under this noise runs, day and night, a deep hum. That is the noise of the spring, a vibrating boom which is neither bees nor falling water nor the wind in treetops, but the purring of the warm, happy world. Up to this year, Mowgli had always delighted in the turn of the seasons. It was he who generally saw the first eye of the spring deep down among the grasses, and the first bank of spring clouds which are like nothing else in the jungle. His voice could be heard in all sorts of wet, star-lighted, blossoming places, helping the big frogs through their choruses, or mocking the little upside-down owls that hoot through the white nights. Like all his people, spring was the season he chose for his flittings, moving for the mere joy of rushing through the warm air thirty, forty, or fifty miles between twilight and the morning star, and coming back panting and laughing and wreathed with strange flowers. The four did not follow him on these wild ringings of the jungle, but went off to sing songs with other wolves. The jungle people are very busy in the spring, and Mowgli could hear them grunting and screaming and whistling according to their kind. Their voices then are different from their voices at other times of the year, and that is one of the reasons why spring in the jungle is called the time of new talk. But that spring, as he told Bagheera, his stomach was changed in him. Ever since the bamboo shoots turned spotty brown, he had been looking forward to the morning when the smells should change. But when the morning came, and more the peacock, blazing in bronze and blue and gold, cried it aloud along the misty woods, and Mowgli opened his mouth to send on the cry, the words choked between his teeth, and a feeling came over him that began at his toes and ended in his hair, a feeling of pure unhappiness, so that he looked himself over to be sure that he had not trod on a thorn. More cried the new smells, the other birds took it over, and from the rocks by the Wengunga he heard Bagheera's hoarse scream, something between the scream of an eagle and the neighing of a horse. There was a yelling and scattering of the bandar log in the new budding branches above, and there stood Mowgli, his chest, filled to answer more, sinking in little gasps as the breath was driven out of it by this unhappiness. He stared all round him, but he could see no more than the mocking bandar log scudding through the trees, and more, his tail spread in full splendour, dancing on the slopes below. The smells have changed, screamed Moor. Good hunting, little brother. Where is thy answer? 
Little brother good hunting, whistled Chill the kite, and his mate swooping down together. The two baffed under Mowgli's nose, so close that a pinch of downy white feathers brushed away. A light spring rain, elephant rain they call it, drove across the jungle in a belt half a mile wide, left the new leaves wet and nodding behind, and died out in a double rainbow and a light roll of thunder. The spring hum broke out for a minute and was silent. But all the jungle folk seemed to be giving tongue at once. All except Mowgli. I have eaten good food, he said to himself. I have drunk good water. Nor does my throat burn and grow small, as it did when I bit the blue-spotted root that Oo the turtle said was clean food. But my stomach is heavy, and I have given very bad talk to Bagheera and others, people of the jungle and my people. Now, too, I am hot, and now I am cold, and now I am neither hot nor cold, but angry with that which I cannot see. Ooh, it is time to make a running. Tonight I will cross the ranges. Yes, I will make a spring running to the marshes of the north and back again. I have hunted too easily too long. The four shall come with me, for they grow as fat as white grubs. He called, but never one of the four answered. They were far beyond earshot, singing over the spring songs, the moon and sambora songs with the wolves of the pack. For in the springtime, the jungle people make very little difference between the day and the night. He gave the sharp, barking note, but his only answer was the mocking meow of the little spotted tree cat winding in and out among the branches for early bird's nests. At this he shook all over with rage and half drew his knife. Then he became very haughty, though there was no one to see him, and stalked severely down the hillside, chin up and eyebrows down. But never a single one of his people asked him a question, for they were all too busy with their own affairs. Yes, said Mowgli to himself, though in his heart he knew that he had no reason. Let the red doll come from the Deccan, or the red flower dance among the bamboos, and all the jungle runs whining to Mowgli, calling him great elephant names. But now, because I of the spring is red, and more, forsooth, must show his naked legs in some spring dance, the jungle goes mad as tabaki. By the bull that bought me, am I the master of the jungle, or am I not? Be silent. What do ye hear? A couple of young wolves of the pack were cantering down a path, looking for open ground in which to fight. You will remember that the law of the jungle forbids fighting where the pack can see. Their neck bristles were as stiff as wire, and they bayed furiously, crouching for the first grapple. Mowgli leaped forward, caught one outstretched throat in either hand, expecting to fling the creatures backward, as he had often done in games or pack hunts but he had never before interfered with a spring fight. The two leaped forward and dashed him aside, and without word to waste, rolled over and over close locked. Mowgli was on his feet almost before he fell. His knife and his white teeth were bared, and at that minute he would have killed both for no reason but that they were fighting when he wished them to be quiet, although every wolf has full right under the law to fight. He danced round them with lowered shoulders and quivering hand, ready to send in a double blow when the first flurry of the scuffle should be over. But while he waited, the strength seemed to ebb from his body, the knife-point lowered, and he sheathed the knife and watched. "'I have surely eaten poison,' he sighed at last. "'Since I broke up the council with the red flower, since I killed Shere Khan, none of the pack could fling me aside. And these be only tail-wolves in the pack,' little hunters. My strength is gone from me, and presently I shall die. O oh, Mowgli, why dost thou not kill them both? The fight went on till one wolf ran away, and Mowgli was left alone on the torn and bloody ground, looking now at his knife and now at his legs and arms, while the feeling of unhappiness he had never known before covered him as water covers a log. He killed early that evening, and ate but little, so as to be in good fettle for his spring running. And he ate alone, because all the jungle people were away singing or fighting. It was a perfect white night, as they call it. All green things seemed to have made a month's growth since the morning. The branch that was yellow-leaved the day before dripped sap when Mowgli broke it. The mosses curled deep and warm over his feet, the young grass had no cutting edges, and all the voices of the jungle boomed like one deep harp-spring touched by the moon, the moon of new talk, 
who splashed her light full on rock and pool, slipped it between trunk and creeper, and sifted it through a million leaves. Forgetting his unhappiness, Mowgli sang aloud with pure delight as he settled into his stride. It was more like flying than anything else, for he had chosen the long downward slope that leads to the northern marshes through the heart of the main jungle, where the springy ground deadened the fall of his feet. A man-taught man would have picked his way with many stumbles through the cheating moonlight, but Mowgli's muscles, trained by years of experience, bore him up as though he were a feather. When a rotten log or a hidden stone turned under his foot, he saved himself, never checking his pace, without effort and without thought. When he tired of ground-going, he threw up his hands monkey-fashion to the nearest creeper and seemed to float rather than to climb up into the thin branches, whence he would follow a tree road till his mood changed and he shot downward in a long, leafy curve to the levels again. There were still hot hollows surrounded by wet rocks where he could hardly breathe for the heavy scent of the night flowers and the bloom along the creeper buds, dark avenues where the moonlight lay in belts as regular as checkered marbles in a church aisle, thickets where the wet young growth stood breast high about him and threw its arms round his waist, and hilltops crowned with broken rock where he leaped from stone to stone above the lairs of the frightened little foxes. He would hear, very faint and far off, the chug-drug of a boar sharpening his tusks on a bowl, and would come across the great grey brute all alone, scribing and rending the bark of a tall tree, his mouth dripping with foam and his eyes blazing like fire. Or he would turn aside to the sound of clashing horns and hissing grunts, and dash past a couple of furious sambo, staggering to and fro with lowered heads, striped with blood that showed black in the moonlight. Or at some rushing ford he would hear Jakala the crocodile bellowing like a bull, or disturb a twined knot of the poison people, but before they could strike he would be away and across the glistening shingle deep in the jungle again. So he ran, sometimes shouting, sometimes singing to himself, the happiest thing in all the jungle that night, till the smell of flowers warned him that he was near the marshes, and those lay far beyond his furthest hunting ground. Here again a man-trained man would have sunk overhead in three strides, but Mowgli's feet had eyes in them, and they passed him from tussock to tussock and clump to quaking clump without asking help from the eyes in his head. He ran out to the middle of the swamp, disturbing the duck as he ran, and sat down on a moss-coated tree trunk lapped in the black water. The marsh was awake all round him, for in the spring the bird people sleep very lightly, and companies of them were coming or going the night through. But no one took any notice of Mowgli sitting among the tall reeds, humming songs without words, and looking at the soles of his hard brown feet in case of neglected thorns. All his unhappiness seemed to have been left behind in his own jungle, and he was beginning a full-throat song when it came back again ten times worse than before. This time Mowgli was frightened. It is here also, he said half aloud. It has followed me. And he looked over his shoulder to see whether the it were not standing behind him. There is no one here. The night noises of the marsh went on, but never a bird or beast spoke to him, and the new feeling of misery grew. I have surely eaten poison, he said in an awe-stricken voice, it must be that carelessly I have eaten poison, and my strength is going from me. I was afraid. And yet it was not I that was afraid. Mowgli was afraid when the two wolves fought. Akela, or even Fa, would have silenced them. Yet Mowgli was afraid. That is true sign I have eaten poison. But what do they care in the jungle? They sing and howl and fight and run in companies under the moon. And I, hi my... I am dying in the marshes of that poison which I have eaten. He was so sorry for himself that he nearly wept. And after, he went on, they will find me lying in the black water. Nay, I will go back to my own jungle, and I will die upon the council rock. And Bagheera, whom I love, if he is not screaming in the valley, Bagheera perhaps may watch by what is left for a little, lest Chill use me as he used Akela. A large, warm tear splashed down on his knee, and, miserable as he was, Mowgli felt happy that he was so miserable, if you can understand that upside-down sort of happiness. 
as Childekite used Akela, he repeated, on the night I saved the pack from Red Dog. He was quiet for a little, thinking of the last word of the lone wolf, which you, of course, remember. Now Akela said to me many foolish things before he died, for when he died our stomachs change. He said, Nonetheless, I am of the jungle. In his excitement, as he remembered the fight on Wengunga Bank, he shouted the last words aloud, and a wild buffalo cow among the reeds sprang to her knees, snorting, Man! Ah, said Mysa, the wild buffalo. Mowgli could hear him turn in his wallow. That is no man. It is only the hairless wolf of the CNE pack. On such nights runs he to and fro. Ah, said the cow, dropping her head again to graze. I thought it was man. I say no. Oh, Mowgli, is it danger? Lowed Mysa. Oh, Mowgli, is it danger? The boy called back mockingly. That is all Mysa thinks for. Is it danger? But for Mowgli, who goes to and fro in the jungle by night watching, what do ye care? How loud he cries, said the cow. Thus do they cry, Mysa answered contemptuously, who, having torn up the grass, know not how to eat it. For less than this, Mowgli groaned to himself, for less than this even last rains I had pricked Mysa out of his wallow and ridden him through the swamp on a rush halter. He stretched a hand to break one of the feathery reeds, but drew it back with a sigh. Mysa went on steadily chewing the cud, and the long grass ripped where the cow grazed. I will not die here, he said angrily. Mysa, who is of one blood with Jakala and the pig, would see me. Let us go beyond the swamp and see what comes. Never have I run such a spring running, hot and cold together. Up, Mowgli! He could not resist the temptation of stealing across the reeds to Mysa and pricking him with the point of his knife. The great dripping bull broke out of his wallow like a shell exploding, while Mowgli laughed till he sat down. Say now that the hairless wolf of the CNE pack once herded thee, Mysa, he called. Wolf? Thou? the bull snorted, stamping in the mud. All the jungle knows thou wast a herder of tame cattle. Such a man's brat as shouts in the dust by the crops yonder. Thou of the jungle. What hunter would have crawled like a snake among the leeches and for a muddy jest, a jackal's jest, have shamed me before my cow. Come to firm ground and I will. I will. Mysa frothed at the mouth, for Mysa has nearly the worst temper of anyone in the jungle. Mowgli watched him huff and blow with eyes that never changed. When he could make himself heard through the spattering mud, he said, What man pack lair here by the marshes, my sir? This is new jungle to me. Go north, then, roared the angry bull, for Mowgli had pricked him rather sharply. It was a naked cowherd's jest. Go and tell them at the village at the foot of the marsh. The man pack do not love jungle tales. Nor do I think, my sir, that a scratch more or less on thy hide is any matter for a council. But I will go and look at this village. Yes, I will go. Softly now. It is not every night that the master of the jungle comes to herd thee. He stepped out to the shivering ground on the edge of the marsh, well knowing that my sir would never charge over it, and laughed as he ran to think of the bull's anger. My strength is not altogether gone, he said. It may be that the poison is not to the bone. There is a star sitting low yonder. He looked at it between his half-shut hands. By the bull that bought me, it is the red flower, the red flower that I lay beside before, before I came even to the first sea and pack. Now that I have seen, I will finish the running. The marsh ended in a broad plain where a light twinkled. It was a long time since Mowgli had concerned himself with the doings of men, but this night the glimmer of the red flower drew him forward. I will look, said he, as I did in the old days, and I will see how far the man-pack has changed. Forgetting that he was no longer in his own jungle, where he could do what he pleased, he trod carelessly through the dew-loaded grasses till he came to the hut where the light stood. Three or four yelping dogs gave tongue, for he was on the outskirts of a village. Ho, oh, said Mowgli, sitting down noiselessly after sending back a deep wolf growl that silenced the curs. What comes will come, Mowgli, but what hast thou to do any more with the lairs of the man-pack? 
He rubbed his mouth, remembering where a stone had struck it years ago when the other man pack had cast him out. The door of the hut opened, and a woman stood peering out into the darkness. A child cried, and the woman said over her shoulder, Sleep. It was but a jackal that waked the dog. In a little time morning comes. Mowgli in the grass began to shake as though he had fever. He knew that voice well, but to make sure he cried softly, surprised to find how man's talk came back. Meswa, oh Meswa. Who calls? said the woman, a quiver in her voice. Hast thou forgotten? said Mowgli. His throat was dry as he spoke. If it be thou, what name did I give thee? Say. She had half shut the door, and her hand was clutching at her breast. Nathu, ohi Nathu, said Mowgli, for, as you remember, that was the name Meswa gave him when he first came to the man-pack. Come, my son, she called, and Mowgli stepped into the light and looked full at Meswa, the woman who had been good to him, and whose life he had saved from the man-pack so long before. She was older, and her hair was grey, but her eyes and her voice had not changed. Woman-like, she expected to find Mowgli where she had left him, and her eyes travelled upward in a puzzled way from his chest to his head that touched the top of the door. My son, he stammered, and then sinking to his feet, but it is no longer my son. It is a godling of the woods, a high. As he stood in the red light of the oil lamp, strong, tall, and beautiful, his long black hair sweeping over his shoulders, the knife swinging at his neck, and his head crowned with a wreath of white jasmine, he might easily have been mistaken for some wild god of a jungle legend. The child, half asleep on a cot, sprang up and shrieked aloud with terror. Mesua turned to soothe him, while Mowgli stood still, looking in at the water jars and the cooking pots, the grain bin, and all the other human belongings that he found himself remembering so well. What wilt thou eat or drink? Mesua murmured. This is all thine. We owe our lives to thee. But art thou him I called Nathu? Or a godling, indeed? I am Nathu, said Mowgli. I am very far from my own place. I saw this light and came hither. I did not know thou wast here. After we came to Kaniwara, Mesua said timidly, the English would have helped us against those villagers that sought to burn us. Rememberest thou? Indeed, I have not forgotten. But when the English law was made ready, we went to the village of those evil people, and it was no more to be found. That also I remember, said Mowgli, with a quiver of his nostril. My man, therefore, took service in the fields, and at last, for indeed he was a strong man, we held a little land here. It is not so rich as the old village, but we do not need much, we two. Where is he, the man that dug in the dirt when he was afraid on that night? He is dead, a year. And he? Mowgli pointed to the child my son that was born two rains ago. If thou art a godling, give him the favour of the jungle, that he may be safe among thy, thy people, as we were safe on that night. She lifted up the child, who, forgetting his fright, reached out to play with the knife that hung on Mowgli's chest, and Mowgli put the little fingers aside very carefully. And if thou art Nathu, whom the tigers carried away, Meswa went on choking, he is then thy younger brother. Give him an elder brother's blessing. Ay, my, what do I know of the thing called a blessing? I am neither a godling nor his brother, and... Oh, mother, mother, my heart is heavy in me. He shivered as he set down the child. Like enough, said Masawa, bustling among the cooking pots. This comes of running about the marshes by night. Beyond question, the fever has soaked thee to the marrow. Mowgli smiled a little at the idea of anything in the jungle hurting him. I will make a fire, and thou shalt drink warm milk. Put away the jasmine wreath, the smell is heavy in so small a place. Mowgli sat down, muttering with his face in his hands. All manner of strange feelings that he had never felt before were running over him, exactly as though he had been poisoned, and he felt dizzy and a little sick. He drank the warm milk in long gulps, Mesua patting him on the shoulder from time to time, 
not quite sure whether he were her son Nathu of the long-ago days, or some wonderful jungle being, but glad to feel that he was at least flesh and blood. Son, she said at last, her eyes were full of pride, have any told thee that thou art beautiful beyond all men? Huh? said Mowgli, for naturally he had never heard anything of the kind. Mesua laughed softly and happily. The look in his face was enough for her. Am I the first, then? It is right, though it comes seldom, that a mother should tell her son these good things. Thou art very beautiful. Never have I looked upon such a man. Mowgli twisted his head and tried to see over his own hard shoulder, and Masua laughed again so long that Mowgli, not knowing why, was forced to laugh with her, and the child ran from one to the other, laughing too. Nay, thou must not mock thy brother, said Masua, catching him to her breast. When thou art one half as fair, we will marry thee to the youngest daughter of the king, and thou shalt ride great elephants. Mowgli could not understand one word in three of the talk here, the warm milk was taking effect on him after his long run, so he curled up and in a minute was deep asleep. And Mesua put the hair back from his eyes, drew a cloth over him, and was happy. Jungle fashion, he slept out the rest of that night and all the next day, for his instincts, which never wholly slept, warned him that there was nothing to fear. He waked at last with a bound that shook the hut, for the cloth over his face made him dream of traps, and there he stood his hand on his knife, the sleep all heavy in his rolling eyes, ready for any fight. Mesua laughed and set the evening meal before him. There were only a few coarse cakes baked over the smoky fire, some rice and a lump of sour preserved tamarinds, just enough to go on with till he could get to his evening kill. The smell of the dew in the marshes made him hungry and restless. He wanted to finish his spring running, but the child insisted on sitting in his arms, and Mesa would have it that his long blue-black hair must be combed out. So she sang, as she combed, foolish little baby songs, now calling Mowgli her son, and now begging him to give some of his jungle power to the child. The hut door was closed, but Mowgli heard a sound he knew well, and saw Mesua's jaw drop with horror as a great grey paw came under the bottom of the door and Grey Brother outside whined a muffled and penitent whine of anxiety and fear. Out and wait! Ye would not come when I called, said Mowgli in jungle talk, without turning his head, and the great Grey Paw disappeared. Do not, do not bring thy, thy servants with thee, said Mesua. I, we have always lived at peace with the jungle. It is peace, said Mowgli, rising. Think of that night on the road to Kanewara. There were scores of such folk before thee and behind thee. But I see that even in springtime the jungle people do not always forget. Mother, I go. Mesua drew aside humbly. He was indeed a wood god, she thought. But as his hand was on the door, the mother in her made her throw her arms around Mowgli's neck again and again. Come back, she whispered. Son or no son, come back, for I love thee. Look, he too grieves. The child was crying because the man with the shiny knife was going away. Come back again, Mesua repeated. By night or by day, this door is never shut to thee. Mowgli's throat worked as though the cords in it were being pulled, and his voice seemed to be dragged from it as he answered, I will surely come back. And now, he said, as he put by the head of the fawning wolf on the threshold, I have a little cry against thee, grey brother. Why came ye not all four when I called so long ago? So long ago? It was but last night. I, we, were singing in the jungle the new songs, for this is the time of new talk. Rememberest thou? Truly, truly. And as soon as the songs were sung, grey brother went on earnestly, I followed thy trail. I ran from all the others and followed hot foot. But, O oh, little brother, what hast thou done? eating and sleeping with the man-pack. If he had come when I called, this had never been, said Mowgli, running much faster. And now what is to be, said Grey Brother. Mowgli was just going to answer when a girl in a white cloth came down some path that led from the outskirts of the village. Grey Brother dropped out of sight at once, and Mowgli backed noiselessly into a field of high-springing crops. 
He could almost have touched her with his hand when the warm green stalks closed before his face and he disappeared like a ghost. The girl screamed, for she thought she had seen a spirit, and then she gave a deep sigh. Mowgli parted the stalks with his hands and watched her till she was out of sight. And now I do not know, he said, sighing in his turn. Why did ye not come when I called? We follow thee, we follow thee, Grey Brother mumbled, licking at Mowgli's heel. We follow thee always, except in the time of the new talk. And would ye follow me to the man-pack? Mowgli whispered. Did I not follow thee on the night our old pack cast thee out? Who waked thee lying among the crops? Aye, but again. Have I not followed thee to-night? Aye, but again and again, and it may be again, Grey Brother. Grey Brother was silent. When he spoke he growled to himself. The Black One spoke truth. And he said, Man goes to man at the last. Raksha, our mother, said, So also said Akela on the night of Red Dog, Mowgli muttered. So also says Ka, who is wiser than us all. What dost thou say, Grey Brother? They cast thee out once with bad talk. They cut thy mouth with stones. They sent Boldeo to slay thee. They would have thrown thee into the red flower. Thou, and not I, hast said that they are evil and senseless. Thou, and not I, I follow my own people, didst let in the jungle upon them. Thou, and not I, didst make song against them more bitter even than our song against Red Dog. I ask thee what thou sayest. They were talking as they ran. Grey Brother cantered on a while without replying, and then he said, between bound and bound as it were, Man-cub, master of the jungle, son of Raksha, lair brother to me, though I forget for a little while in the spring, thy trail is my trail, thy lair is my lair, thy kill is my kill, and thy death-fight is my death-fight. I speak for the three. But what wilt thou say to the jungle? That is well thought. Between the sight and the kill it is not good to wait. Go before and cry them all to the council rock, and I will tell them what is in my stomach. But they may not come. In the time of new talk they may forget me. Hast thou then forgotten nothing? snapped Grey Brother over his shoulder, as he laid himself down to gallop, and Mowgli followed, thinking. At any other season the news would have called all the jungle together with bristling necks, but now they were busy hunting and fighting and killing and singing. From one to another Grey Brother ran, crying, The master of the jungle goes back to man, come to the council rock. And the happy, eager people only answered, He will return in the summer heats, the rains will drive him to lair, run and sing with us, Grey Brother. But the master of the jungle goes back to man. Grey Brother would repeat. Eee, yow! Is the time of new talk any less sweet for that? They would reply. So when Mowgli, heavy-hearted, came up through the well-remembered rocks to the place where he had been brought into the council, he found only the four. Baloo, who was nearly blind with age, and the heavy, cold-blooded car coiled around Akela's empty seat. Thy trail ends here, then, Manling, said Car as Mowgli threw himself down, his face in his hands. Cry thy cry. We be of one blood, thou and I, man and snake, together. Why did I not die under Red Dog? the boy moaned. My strength is gone from me, and it is not any poison. By night and by day I hear a double step upon my trail. When I turn my head, it is as though one had hidden himself from me that instant. I go to look behind the trees, and he is not there. I call and none cry again, but it is as though one listened and kept back the answer. I lie down, but I do not rest. I run the spring running, but I am not made still. I bathe, but I am not made cool. The kill sickens me, but I have no heart to fight except I kill. The red flower is in my body, my bones are water, and I know not what I know. What need of talk? said Baloo slowly, turning his head to where Mowgli lay. Akela by the river said it. 
that Mowgli should drive Mowgli back to the man-pack. I said it. But who listens now to Baloo? Bagheera. Where is Bagheera this night? He knows also. It is the law. When we met at Cold Lairs, Manling, I knew it, said Kaa, turning a little in his mighty coils. Man goes to man at the last, though the jungle does not cast him out. The four looked at one another, and at Mowgli, puzzled but obedient. The jungle does not cast me out, then? Mowgli stammered. Grey Brother and the three growled furiously, beginning, So long as we live, none shall dare, but Baloo checked them. I taught thee the law. It is for me to speak, he said. And though I cannot now see the rocks before me, I see far. Little frog, take thine own trail. Make thy lair with thine own blood and pack and people. But when there is need of foot or tooth or eye, or a word carried swiftly by night, Remember, master of the jungle, the jungle is thine at call. The middle jungle is thine also, said Ka. I speak for no small people. Hi, mine, my brothers, cried Mowgli, throwing up his arms with a sob. I know not what I know. I would not go, but I am drawn by both feet. How shall I leave these nights? Nay, look up, little brother, Baloo repeated. There is no shame in this hunting. When the honey is eaten, we leave the empty hive. Having cast the skin, said Ka, we may not creep into it afresh. It is the law. Listen, dearest of all to me, said Baloo, there is neither word nor will here to hold thee back. Look up. Who may question the master of the jungle? I saw thee playing among the white pebbles yonder when thou wast a little frog. And Bagheera, that bought thee for the price of a young bull newly killed, saw thee also. Of that looking over, we too only remain. For Raksha, thy lair mother, is dead with thy lair father. The old wolf pack is long since dead. Thou knowest whither Shere Khan went, and Akela died among the doles where, but for thy wisdom and strength, the second Siony pack would also have died. There remains nothing but old bones. It is no longer the man-cub that asks leave of his pack, but the master of the jungle that changes his trail. Who shall question man in his ways? But Bagheera and the bull that bought me, said Mowgli, I would not... His words were cut short by a roar and a crash in the thicket below, and Bagheera, light, strong and terrible as always, stood before him. Therefore, he said, stretching out a dripping right paw. I did not come. It was a long hunt, but he lies dead in the bushes now, a bull in his second year, the bull that frees thee, little brother. All debts are paid now. For the rest, my word is Baloo's word. He licked Mowgli's foot. Remember, Bagheera loved thee, he cried and bounded away. At the foot of the hill he cried again, long and loud, a good hunting on a new trail, master of the jungle. Remember, Bagheera loved thee. Thou hast heard, said Baloo. There is no more. Go now. But first come to me, O oh wise little frog. Come to me. It is hard to cast the skin, said Ka, as Mowgli sobbed and sobbed with his head on the blind bear's side and his arms round his neck, while Baloo tried feebly to lick his feet. The stars are thin, said Grey Brother, snuffing at the dawn wind. Where shall we lair today? For from now we follow new trails. And this is the last of the Mowgli stories. The Out Song This is the song that Mowgli heard behind him in the jungle till he came to Mesua's door again. Baloo For the sake of him who showed one wise frog the jungle road, keep the law the man pack make for thy blind old Baloo's sake. Cleaned or tainted, hot or stale, hold it as it were the trail, 
through the day and through the night, questing neither left nor right. For the sake of him who loves thee beyond all else that moves, when thy pack would make thee pain, say, Tabaki sings again. When thy pack would work thee ill, say, Shere Khan is yet to kill. When the knife is drawn to slay, keep the law and go thy way. Root and honey, palm and spathe, guard a cub from harm and scathe. Wood and water, wind and tree, jungle favour go with thee. Ka. Anger is the egg of fear, only lidless eyes are clear. Cobra poison none may leech, even so with cobra speech. Open talk shall call to thee, strength whose mate is courtesy. Send no lunge beyond thy length, lend no rotten bough thy strength. Gauge thy gape with buck or goat, lest thine eye should choke thy throat. After gorging wouldst thou sleep, look, the den is hid and deep. Lest a wrong by thee forgot, draw thy killer to the spot. East and west and north and south, wash thy hide and close thy mouth. Pit and rift and blue pool brim, middle jungle follow him. Wood and water, wind and tree, jungle favour go with thee. Bagheera In the cage my life began, well I know the worth of man. By the broken lock that freed, man-cub, where the man-cubs breed. Scenting dew or starlight pale, Choose no tangled tree-cat trail. Pack or council, hunt or den, Cry no truce with jackal men. Feed them silence when they say, Come with us an easy way. Feed them silence when they seek Help of thine to hurt the weak. Make no bandar's boast of skill, Hold thy peace above the kill. Let nor call, nor song, nor sign Turn thee from thy hunting line. Morning mist or twilight clear, Serve him, wardens of the deer. Wood and water, wind and tree, Jungle favour, go with thee. The Three On the trail that thou must tread To the thresholds of our dread, Where the flower blossoms red, through the nights when thou shalt lie prisoned from our mother sky, hearing us thy loves go by. In the dawns when thou shalt wake to the toil thou canst not break, heart-sick for the jungle's sake, wood and water, wind and tree, wisdom, strength and courtesy, jungle favour go with thee. This concludes the reading of The Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling originally published in 1894. This book was read by Ralph Caution. This unabridged recording was produced in 2011 by Blackstone Audio Inc., which holds the copyright. Neither this recording nor any portion of it may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authorization from Blackstone Audio Inc. If you would like to obtain a monthly update telling you about new releases, Call 1-800-SAY-BOOK. That's 1-800-729-2665. For a complete listing of our titles, visit our website at www.blackstoneaudio.com. Thank you.